Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Chatting with Nuts. This is episode number 23, uh, and we have one of the, you know, the GOAT was Michael Jordan wearing 2-3, and now I feel like I am interviewing a future GOAT of fantasy and sci-fi, and as quickly, I think I think it actually is my favorite sci-fi author now, uh, and that is Christopher Rocchio, the author of Empire of Silence and the Sun Eater series, all the subsequent books in there, uh, also publishing a Thor story, I believe, in an anthology, is that correct? Uh, it's out, actually. Uh, I did a Thor story in Avengers number 50. It came out uh, November last year. Congratulations. I, I, uh, I was That was the last thing I looked up before we hopped in the call together, so I didn't have all the information. Um, yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. How are you doing, man? I'm hanging in there. It's been a good day. We we're just talking before this. I've been playing uh, Elden Ring between. I had a I had another interview today, actually. It's the first time I had two in one day, and my wife oh. is starting to think I'm actually important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I snuck a little bit of the game in between, so that was cool. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. I've been I've been playing Elden Ring. I told you, and I'll tell everyone here. I got back from Vegas yesterday, uh, jumped right into Elden Ring. Knew I had this interview tonight. I've been preparing for that back and forth all day. Hard hard to peel me off of the television, uh, but I knew I was going to be excited to be here tonight because, uh, man, I I wanted to talk to you, uh, not because. Um, not because of anything other than the fact that I just really love your books, man. I've read two of them so far, and you have completely captivated me. So thank you uh, for the stuff that you've written so far. And I can't wait to get the Demon in White. And then obviously we have book four coming at the end of March. Uh, and then also we also have your fifth book. We even have that. So we have Kingdoms of Death next month, right? And then we have yeah. Ashes of Man. First off, well, second off, really. Uh, your covers are out outstanding. You're American. Yeah, got I'm really American. lucky in that department. Yeah. How much of a say do you have in your covers? Uh, it, so it depends on the publisher. With Daw, the covers you're talking about, I actually have a lot of uh, a lot of say. Uh, they've been uh, really good about it. I usually – so I actually got to pick my artist for book one. Uh, they were like, you have anyone you're thinking of? So we picked Sam Weber, who I've always been a fan of. He did the Dune folio. Uh, but then he did the New Sun folios, Gene Wolfe books, and he oh. was busy, couldn't do book two. So they picked Kieran Yanner to, to replace him. And Kieran, you know, they picked it because he kind of kind of a similar style. And uh, working with both of them has been has been awesome. But what I've done usually is I will I'll, I'll tell my publisher, OK, I've got like three different ideas for the cover. Which one do you think marketing wants? They'll talk to marketing, they'll come back, and then I will write up a description of what it should look like. And the amount of back and forth is usually pretty minimal. Uh, I will, um, you know, I will get basically mostly the final cover. If there are any like little suggestions, I'll, I'll tweak it uh, with the lesser devil and other stories. Cause I kind of was the, uh, I was kind of the editor for that one. Cause uh, and Derrida books was doing a little special edition. I was a little bit more involved. I went back and forth with Kieran a lot more on like preliminary sketches and things. Uh, but usually maybe they'll send, you know, a couple thumbnails of like how the characters might be blocked on the, on the on the finished piece and figure out hey well, let's move the arm or let's you know maybe we'll do the one with five people instead of three or something like that but uh, i try really hard because the reason most publishers don't want authors involved in the cover design process is because they will get really really persnickety about you know like <laughs> oh that's not what the brooch should look like right. and like at a certain point you got to let go because it's it's the artist's project right and and, and uh, not all of us can be Todd Lockwood and write the book and paint the cover so uh, yeah. you know as nice as that might be and so um, you know I'll step back but usually like well, when I worked for because I worked for Bain Books for seven years uh, the authors were usually gifted their covers and they were you know expected to be grateful <laughs> and uh, that's far more typical that's how it's kind of been with my uh, my UK uh, publishers for example they, they will just sort of you know like what are you thinking and i'll be saying you know maybe you know something with a son whatever right and they'll be like cool and then i'll get the cover and that's it right uh and then with like the translation covers like the german ones i don't even i don't even know like i just you know, <laughs> like, oh it's coming out next week interesting <laughs> uh, you know i uh I, I, oh and they changed the title because that doesn't mean demon and white in german i know enough to know that's not it uh, and uh, and that's sort of a pretty detached thing. But with uh, with Daw, at least, I've been really hands on, which has been nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, uh, DAW uh, also publishes Tad Williams, who has some of my favorite covers of all time. Those old Whalen covers, uh, oh, and yeah. I was heartbroken to find out that Whalen won't be doing books three and four of his uh, Last King of Ostenard. Um, So as long as they don't change the Sun Eater covers, we're good. 
I yeah, well, we're almost there. I've got, I got two more I need to get, probably. It'll probably be seven books. So it's going to be... I was going to ask you that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite uh, got the ink dry on the contract yet, but because they split book four into books four and five, and I was counting on another, you know, giant, you know, door stopper to finish out the series, I'm going to try and convince them to just pre-split books six and seven. So yeah. that's my plan. Get, get out ahead of it, right? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, trying to pull this book apart and turn it into two books was, it was easier than I thought it would be, but it was still an unnecessary extra step you know, uh, it, well, under the circumstances, it was unavoidable. But, you know, if I can avoid it again, that would be nice. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm always happy to read more books. Uh, they could just be one big one, you know, like with the Bible prints. And I would probably read them like that. Uh, however you want to do it. But I like that we get more covers and more dope titles. So no, that's yeah, that's the, the definite advantage. I do have those titles picked out. So oh. um, I'm at least ahead on that one. Very nice. I'm excited to see Ashes of Man. I was excited to see the reveal, uh, and, and I love the title of it. Uh, Darren says, uh, thank, by the way, Darren, thank you for the five spies. Says, Just bought the UK covers. Haven't started yet, but heard great things. Oh, um, well, thanks, Darren. I hope you like them. I, I have a feeling Darren will because I think they're excellent, man. I really do. Um, this is one of those things where I wanted to, I, I've been wanting to interview you for a while, but I wanted to make sure to dive in and, and see what I thought. And I felt so comfortable inviting you on because of how much I just genuinely enjoyed it. I found myself taking, I said this in my Howling Dark review, but I found myself taking a back seat as far as being a critic or a reviewer and just enjoying the journey with Hadrian, uh, who I find to be a very compelling character. Uh, I thought one of the coolest things uh, that I've, I've, I've read a lot about the interviews you've done, wanting to know where the story came from. I think it was back in like 2014, you did an interview and you said like the beginning of your storytelling and writing happened when you were eight years old on the playground. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. And you were with uh, your friends and they were Dragon Ball Z characters, which I got to say, those are the cool kids in your class for sure. And you didn't know it at the time. So you, you were Batman and that's yeah, kind of yes. where it all started. And, so that's where Empire of Silence started, really. That's where I started writing. Whether or not you could call it Empire of Silence is uh, is maybe a stretch, right? Because it right. and obviously the book uses the the ship of Theseus thing. But if you if you think about it like it's the ship of Theseus, I started writing uh, you know, basically, you know, Batman and Dragon Ball Z characters, sort of just like notes, you know, and it, we would all play, we would play make believe, right, uh, at recess. And like one of us was always the villain, and we'd defeat him every Friday, and he'd be the next, you know, he'd be a bad guy again. Uh, Monday, he was, you know, a strange kid. Uh, it was sort of his thing. <laughs> and uh, they all moved on, and I, and I just kept writing. And without their, you know, uh, feedback interference uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the little stories I was telling about our characters, uh, I. Uh, slowly started to write initially a fantasy story and then at some point maybe in college it, it turned or high school turned into a science fiction story um although the the line between those is way blurrier than most people think it is or should be um and so by college there's a point around junior year i like wiped the slate clean and said i'm starting over this is going to be you know for for all the chips we're going in and uh, i i wrote a book called The Murdered Son, which was half as long as Empire of Silence is, and started out pretty similarly. Uh, once Hadrian, uh, you know, goes to another planet, let's say, uh, it's a completely different book. Uh, there's no gladiators, there's no Valka. Um, very different, very different book. And I sold that in 2016, about three weeks after I graduated. Uh, wow. And uh, it was the same week I got my job at Bain Books, so I ended up working for uh, the competition, right? Uh, which was, uh, which was, which was interesting. I actually had two badges pretty frequently at conventions and depending on whether or not I was a guest or an exhibitor, I would, I would switch them out to get through whichever door I needed to get through, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, no, it started really, really early, uh, just with, you know, uh, just make the leave on the back of notes, sort of like Tolkien, only I wasn't grading the papers, you know? Right. Yeah, well, I, I like what you said there. You said the lines blur. Um, and, and obviously, Tolkien has been a big influence on you and Frank Herbert, uh, along with many others. But one of the things I've seen you say before in an interview is the fact that you love how many big ideas there are right now. You can kind of do what you want in the genres and science fiction and uh, fantasy. Uh, but one thing to be careful of is that very kind of dogmatic approach, ideology, uh, ideological lines in the sand. 
between the genre. And I kind of pitched Empire Sun. And maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I'm wrong all the time, so I won't be surprised. But I, <laughs> all of us are, right? Um, I think that's also the Dark Souls players in us saying that because we know that we are the tarnished ones, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're all going to die, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with that said, I feel like that Empire of Silence is a really good sci-fi for people who have only read fantasy. Uh, like in general, also for sci-fi readers, but specifically my channel, obviously covering a lot of fantasy. I say, Hey, if you've been apprehensive to trying sci-fi or you've been burned by sci-fi before, and you're not sure if it's for you, man, I feel like I just feel like empire sounds is that perfect gateway drug. Um, and then stands on its own as a pillar, I think in sci-fi as well. Yeah, that was totally by design. Uh, fantasy is a much larger audience. Yeah. And I was trying to sort of pitch for them because there were more of them, which, uh, you know, uh, is a good business decision. Uh, but yeah. it's also the sort of story I wanted to tell, too, because uh, people, uh, this is sort of a lost fact in, in the history of the, of the field, but uh, before the 50s, um, fantasy and science fiction meant very different things. You know, fantasy meant uh, Lovecraft stories, right? It meant weird fiction. And, uh, you know, Lovecraft used to be, uh, you know, the mascot for the World Fantasy Convention. Uh, because that was sort of what the genre used to be. And and science fiction had a lot of space for the John Carter type stories. Those were those were really, you know, the predominant extreme. And you get people like Hugo Gerns back coming in and uh, pretty early on. And he says, you know, well, we need to make this marketable to kids. So we need the parents to understand that there's some educational value or something. And let's, you know, he published like E. Doc Smith, right? And who wasn't a doctor in anything to do with science, you know, like, like space travel and something. He was an entomologist or something, but he had a credential. So they, you know, he <laughs> leaned on that and tried to really class the joint up. And by the time John W. Campbell comes along, he's like, no, we're telling engineer hero stories. And that's where we get the, the Asimovs and the Clarks and the Heinlands. And, and that really sort of defines redefines the genre and a lot of the science fantasy stuff like 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 john carter or like uh, lee brackett stories like nobody reads lee brackett anymore uh just sort of go by the wayside and everybody kind of forgets that you know like really early science fiction had a lot of fantasy in it yeah and uh, i wanted to kind of go back to that we talk a lot about i talk a lot about uh dune is an influence but I, I am as influenced by the older sort of pulp tradition that dune is kind of kind of a, a, an answer to, because as Frank Herbert sort of, in a lot of ways, Paul is kind of like an anti-John Carter, right? Yeah. Uh, he, they're both, you know, guys from outside who come in and use their superpowers to, you know, either help or help the natives, depending on, on which, uh, which story we're talking about, and become king, right? And so I wanted to sort of hark all the way back to, you know, that old tradition uh, with this series, and also write something that sort of fits in with... Uh, fits in with the reading sensibilities of the modern fantasy reader. I think you've done an excellent job. I really do. Um, you know, I'm not the most well-read in sci-fi, but I've, I've read the big ones, right? Like Dune, uh, Hyperion, Foundation. Um, and one of the things that I, I love is that I can see the historical uh, kind of influences that you've taken and put it into your work, which Asimov, at least on the first Foundation trilogy, is heavily based on the Roman Empire and how it fell. And that is something that I immediately picked out when I started reading your works. And I love that so much. Uh, you're a pretty big fan of history, as am I. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I watch a lot of YouTube. So I'm somewhere in the realm of. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, what's your most, what's your favorite uh, setting in history? Oh, man. Uh, if I have to pick one, probably, um, probably the, the Byzantine Empire in like the 6th and 7th century around the reign of Justinian. Uh, it's just a very interesting period. It's, um, you know, Rome is trying to claw back its lost territory in the West. It's got huge problems with the Parthian, or the Sassanids, excuse me, uh, in the East. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also, it's very Christian Rome, which is not the impression of Rome people's heads usually go to. So it's a very different kind of place. There's a lot of very complicated uh, political and theological wrangling about what is and isn't canon, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, like things like Christology and whatnot, uh, theologically speaking. And so there's a lot of like weird, you know, interesting kind of mystical stuff that's happening on the side. Uh, and of course, it's it's a period that's right before the world totally changes. It's right before uh, the rise of Islam. 
right? And so it's really this period that's teetering on the brink of, of, of this very dramatic change. And yeah. so there's this sort of, uh, you know, to, the, to, to us now looking back, there's this kind of tragic quality over the whole period because it's all about to go away. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's a really great setting for, uh, for stories too. I'm a big fan of Guy Gabriel Kay's Serentine Mosaic books, which is a, a fantasy uh, duology that's sort of a fantasy take on that period. But it's just a really fascinating time and place. And it's a time and place we don't really talk about in particular like American history curricula. It's just sort of like eh, glossed over. And it's, a, it's, it's something too. It's a period uh, and a place that we owe a lot to that no one ever talks about, right? There are people who, who say the reason that, you know, Greek and Roman literature and, and thought survived was because of uh, like, uh, like Muslim Spain, right? Or, or Baghdad or whatever, but they completely forget that there were people who could speak Greek the whole time. There's this whole country <laughs> that existed that could absolutely read Aristotle in the original, no problem. And it's actually uh, them who at least preserved the literature because the, um, Islamic world was never really interested in, in the literary side of, of Greek, uh, Greek uh, culture. They were interested in the scientific documents primarily. Uh, and so they did, uh, they did have a focus on that. The only reason we really have a lot of the literary stuff is because the Byzantines kept it around. Uh, and so uh, we owe a lot to them. And uh, it's a period yeah. we, don't really, we don't really look at. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that, that immediately makes me want to go learn more about it, to be honest with you. Um, I'm kind of in a history mood right now because I'm reading The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell which is his Arthurian tale. And, oh man, being in the dark ages, like, I feel like I've been, I'm in there. Right. And they're, they're trying to figure out what a camel is. And I just love, there's something about the mystery that existed in those time periods. And I feel like I find that mystery very uh, present in your work because Hadrian is figuring out a lot of answers. Humanity in space is figuring out a lot of answers uh, and also getting rid of some preconceived notions. And that, that is that historical feel of that. Just like what's next that I, I really love in sci-fi. And I think that you do a very good job of encapsulating that in an empire of silence and, and obviously beyond. Well, thank you. And that's, that's also something I, that's actually pretty deliberate. Um, the thing about, about, uh, science fiction versus fantasy, right? At least this kind of science fiction is that it's in our future, right? And fantasy is is obviously, you know, mostly pointed, it's not urban fantasy, it's pointed towards worlds that are like our past. Yes. And so when we play with, you know, the unknown and the mystical, the magical, the strange, right? Because uh, if you look at like medieval manus- travel manuscripts, you see all sorts of weird things like, why are there dog-headed people? And like, you know, people who like, you know, walk on their heads, like what is going on with these medievals? What are they talking about? But the world is just, you know, very strange, uh, you know, a very big place in that time. And in, in writing this kind of science fiction, I can kind of re-mystify our future, right? Hmm. And so there's a sort of hope, and it is a hope for me that like wherever we're going out there, it's going to be bigger again because the world is, feels very small right now. We're wow. all involved in you know uh geopolitics half a world away and if you don't have an intimate opinion about you know what is going on on the other side of the planet what are you a rube right uh and and it's i don't think it's supposed to be that way it feels very unnatural to me and i hope that the future uh is is bigger you know and is more open in terms of possibility and and scope and so you know, we talk about science fiction as like a like a sense of wonder kind of thing. And for a lot of people, that's like, oh, look at the utopian politics of, of Star Trek. And, um, you know, maybe we'll have overcome all of our petty human uh, faults. I, I'm not so interested in overcoming our petty human faults. I don't think it's possible, mm-hmm. uh, you know. And so I would much rather uh, an optimistic future for me is one that even if terrible things happen, at least has this sort of promise of, of something more. Uh, you know, and, and, and then we can comprehend even and, and to go back to a map that has dragons on the edge, because I'd much rather live in a world where a map has dragons on the edge than than one that's just got Mercator projections. So <laughs> um, I love what you said there, remystifying. Oh, man, that's a that, you know, and, that, and that's another unique thing about your work, at least unique to me, is I'm so used to reading stories in other worlds, and y- you decided to take on the challenge of being 20,000 years in our future, uh, which does mean that you have to abide by a certain historical timeline. Uh, and seeing some of the callbacks that you throw in there are, are really wonderful and just like little 
little like <laughs> just uh, things in in the back of the book. Like uh, I think there's a Rothschild or one of the popular banking families, and I'm like, oh, I know what that is. You know, yeah, they're still around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, and this isn't really a spoiler. I know a lot of people flinch when someone says that, but there are some other families that are recognizable in the series too. The Bourbons are still around. Yes, uh, the Habsburgs and things like that. Uh, they're still have a role to play. Uh, and, and there's a lot of connective tissue. I, I did a talk uh, at an interview earlier today where I talked a little bit about this and how uh, and we, and it, it helps too to connect our history to something that can be that, that sort of bigger mythic thing. Cause you know, instead of, you know, this ancient sage that we're citing who, you know, wrote the spell books we unearthed in this lost library, it's Aristotle, right? Yeah. And it's, it's our Aristotle, which again means that our world, right, can, you know, uh, actually have this sort of adventure and this myth in it. Uh, and and it's something that's really lost in these benighted times. So, uh, you know, I, it's fun for me uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, I, and also being able to have the imagination to put us 20,000 years in the future is also pretty impressive because I was just talking to my wife uh, when we were in Vegas and we're just looking at all the things that have changed because we go to Vegas pretty often. And just how much progress that city makes in like a six month period is incredible. And then I started, of course, thinking about humans and I started thinking about, you know, I'm, thir I'm 31. So 1990 to now uh, is a big difference, right? Uh, so to imagine the technological leaps uh, and also just the political landscape and how that's going to change over like thousands of years takes a lot of foresight. How much time did you put into preparing to answer some of the big questions? Well, it, a lot of it's backfilling, right? Because you can say 20,000 years and then figure out what that means, right? Yeah. Once you've already got the place you want to be at uh, decided. So I already knew I wanted, you know, about a third of the galaxy to really be occupied. I wanted, you know, X million worlds. I wanted it to be really, really big, bigger than I needed it to be. And I knew I wanted space travel to be slower because um, it annoys me when we warp to Vulcan in two minutes. Uh, <laughs> when we started on hyperspace, I don't even know what that is. Um, because if, if, if you can go anywhere instantaneously, it's like everybody's playing the game with a fast travel mechanic. And it yeah. takes, a lot of the, uh, takes a lot of the suspense out of anything, a lot of the cost out of anything. So I already knew broadly what I wanted the world to look like. And I kind of worked backwards to figure out how it got there. So I just did... I just had a short story that's going to come out in April in a book I uh, edited called Time Troopers that's set in uh, ISD 3000, so like 12,000 years earlier. So they don't have uh, shields. They don't have artificial gravity. There's a lot that's missing, right? And so some of the institutions are in place already. The empire is the empire, but it's a lot smaller. And figuring out exactly where things start to change, right, is something that you can actually figure out a lot later. Um, I talked to Lois McMaster Bujold once about her world building, and uh, she really made me feel better because she told me that she doesn't sort of figure stuff out until she needs it. And then mm -hmm. she doesn't change it once it's in. But uh, I think there's a lot of us who feel like we got to be Tolkien, right? I certainly yeah. would like to be, you know. Uh, he's really my hero. But, uh, but you don't need to spend 40 years world building before you write a book, right? And if... Your goal, you know, I assume some people watching one of your writers, if your goal is to be a, a commercial writer, then you can't spend 40 years world building because it's 40 years you're not writing. And so um, I've sort of built the world Bible alongside the books and the books help mm -hmm. me define stuff because that way, um, you know, the world building can often serve the plot or the characters instead of vice versa. And there's a case to be made for doing it in either direction. Um you know, because sometimes if you have the world building first, that can impose some limitations on the storytelling where you have to be really, really creative to get around them. But I found it useful to do it this way. And um, and so a lot of that history isn't really, really uh, pinned down. Um, uh, it gets more pinned down the more I write. And that allows me, you know, uh, opportunities to include new details. But it also lets me get some new story ideas and to figure some stuff out Um you know, like I, I've just been working on an essay about the history of House Marlowe, uh, which I'm going to do something with eventually. I'd like to do sort of a fire and blood book, but I wanted to write this down. And so I've just started to figure out, like, how are they related to the emperors? Like, how does that go yeah. back? Right? Which is it's very easy to just say that they are and just sort of accept that as a bit of world building. 
but uh, then you can go back and explain it later because it doesn't actually impact the story, you know, in, right. in a great way. I, I tell people, like, you don't need to spend a week figuring out the coinage for a country your characters are never going to visit, right? Like, it's yeah. just like, unless that's fun for you, but like world building is a pretty different hobby than, um, uh, than writing. Those are two yeah. like, separate pastimes. And I enjoy both, but I like writing better. So... I, I yeah you know one that's relieving to hear because I, I would I would say that I would like to write more I don't know if I'll ever you know try to get published or anything but I I, I like writing when I do when I write I feel like I'm doing what I want to do uh, there's a big sense of fulfillment when I do that and one of the things that always keeps me back is thinking about how cumbersome things like Westeros and Middle Earth are uh, which is interesting because on the, on the flip side of Tolkien, you have Gurm, who is very much a gardener and kind of makes it up as it goes. Uh, and then he just happened to have a whole history book worth of stuff. Uh, but I always get hung up on the world building uh, because it's something I don't feel naturally great at. Uh, I feel like I do much better in the more personal situations between dialogue between two characters. But I always get stuck when it comes to world building. So hearing you say that actually is very enabling uh, th that I feel like maybe I can actually just write and figure it out as I go. That's awesome. You can. I, I would. I am at the same time a pretty strong advocate for outlining, though. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is, this is one of my usual soapboxes. I think some of the people in the chat will have heard me talk about this before, but uh, but I do think that uh, a lot of writer's block is simply the result of having failed to plan. And so when people get lost, it's because they don't know what the scene they're writing is supposed to be. So if you don't know, like I never know. You know, I don't. I don't know what four hundred different planets do and are for and what they're famous for. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do know that the scene I needed what you know, is, is about these two characters doing this thing. Right. Uh, cause I will have outlined all of that in advance and I'll even do a lot of the world building, uh, you know, uh, as I'm outlining, sorry, I'm seeing, uh, Scott here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is new. I think I did a whole stream about outlines once, but, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, so there's a balance there, right? You know, yeah. I, I don't like the, the architect gardener dichotomy because I think you do hmm. both. Um, I also think it's disingenuous to say that like, for instance, so like Gurm is obviously a gardener. I, I highly doubt, I mean, obviously he doesn't have a ton of outline, but he has some outline, right? Like he has some idea. He turns it into the publisher whenever he did the first trilogy. So I, I think when people, I think you're right. People get kind of lost in that term and they think that they only do it that way. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, and I think a lot of like how to write uh, sort of like books and things are generally unhelpful because they give people a prescriptive list of how to do something. And, yes. and if Stephen King presents you his method uh, and you think, well, he's Stephen King, so I should follow his method, but his method won't work for you. That's right. In the same way that like, you know, an athlete's, a specific athlete's workout regimen isn't going to work for you either. You know, or, uh, you know, if you're a chef, like you're not going to make the food necessarily in exactly the same way as another professional chef. Yeah. Right? They might they might put their, you know, their their mise en place in like a different way. Right. They'll set things up differently. Even if the procedure for making the, the steak or whatever is exactly the same, there's still going to be some differences. Um, and uh, and so I find it really, really unhelpful to give like very didactic writing advice or even to read books about it. Uh, because it's nice to like get an idea from somebody, but you really have to find your own, your own method. Yeah. I, uh, I actually know exactly what you mean. Cause whenever I did pro wrestling, uh, you would see somebody catch fire and get really popular and kind of rise up and you would see about a million people copy that, you know, do you go in the locker room the next week and everyone's wearing, uh, you know, white boots and doing the dudes moves. And you're like, no, you have to take pieces of things. Uh, yeah. you're, you're always standing on the shoulders of giants, but you can't just one for one. It, it doesn't work like that. You don't stand out. Uh, and a lot of times it doesn't work for you. You have to find your own way of getting there. Um, yeah. so I can relate to that a lot. Yeah. Publishing is really bad about this because the, the, the big secret of, of the publishing industry is that they have no idea what makes a hit uh, because it's actually not up to them, right? It's, mm -hmm. up, it's up to you guys, up to the readers. And so as soon as they get one, right, and YA is the really big offender in this department, they will produce 800 carbon copies of it to sort of ride the wave because they know this is in right now. And, of course, people will buy carbon copies of things, right? Sure. Uh, you know, they're like, I want more, you know, Hunger Games. Like, well, we've got Divergent, you know, it's the Hunger Games we have at home, uh, you know, to, to reference the moon. 
Uh, I haven't read either, so I've just heard that that's the, that's the case. Uh, but you know, they, they they're like eight of eighteen hundred of those series come out at the same time, right? And it was the same when it was Twilight and Twilight's clones, and before that, it was it was kind of like a, like an Aragon and its clones phase, and then we go back to Harry Potter, and that's kind of where the modern sort of YA as a separate genre thing really really starts. Uh, and so like everybody will just copy because it's a safe financial bet, uh, but none of it will ever, ever reach the, the original thing. Yeah. It just never gets close. The publishing that, is really bad about of doing exactly the pro wrestling thing. It, it, and it's also uh, movies, the remakes. Oh. I mean, can we get an original idea? Like th- now I'm someone who I'm not going to put my nose up to a remake. I'll watch a remake. Like, thank God they redid Dune, right? <laughs> thank God they redid For Dune. sure. Um, but at the same time, I just, I look at all these things, you know, the 80th Batman movies coming out and it's probably gonna be awesome, but it's like, man, can we get some new IP in here? Can we get an empire of silence? I would like that. But, uh, I mean with movies, right. It's a little different cause it's, it's like hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Yes. It's a big gamble. You just can't afford to be adventurous, right? And, and like streaming, I think maybe has helped this a little bit, but like in a certain sense, right? Even The Witcher is kind of the Game of Thrones we had at home, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they're still trying to replicate Game of Thrones. You know, Lord of the Rings is an attempt, and like this is not to say that like you know Lord of the Rings is lesser than Game of Thrones. I do not feel that way remotely. Uh, quite the opposite. I'm not too much the Tolkien fan. But it's already hit, occupied the sort of like spot in the public consciousness. Yes. And so like Wheel of Time is trying to be the next, you know, Game of Thrones. Lord of the Rings is, uh, The Witcher is, and even Game of Thrones, the prequel, is trying to take that spot or at least try to hold on to the crown that I think nobody wants anymore, uh, to be honest. But that's a, that's a different conversation. Um <laughs> And, uh, and so it, it's, it, we get stuck in these little ruts and I, I think the best thing to do, if you want to be a writer is just do your own thing. Uh, and yeah. if, uh, if it turns out to be the thing, you know, that's great. Right. Uh, you know, good. But if you end up doing kind of, you know, okay, that's fine too. Yeah. And I think, uh, probably a large amount of that has to do with the fact that, in today's day and age, like, you know, getting clicks and getting engagement is king. It's it's everything. And the thing that gets a lot of engagement is this against this wheel. I saw it so many times. So I'm actually I'm a huge fan of Song of Ice and Fire, like massive. Uh, you can tell behind me, right? Yeah, oh, I like it, too. I just, yeah. you know, I like Lord of the Rings that much more, oh, which, so, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I saw a lot of people when the Wheel of Time show was coming out, they said, OK, Wheel of Time, is, you know, the next Game of Thrones, is, is it going to be better? I'm like, it shouldn't really be about being better. Now, there are like there are approaches that could be better, right? Like like writing uh, visual effects. Sure. But as far as like the tone and the themes and things like that, it should have no business really comparing the two. It should try to be its own thing. Um, now whether or not that succeeded, I didn't watch it all, so I can't really say, but I do think that this is a, it's plaguing every new adaptation that comes out. And I think largely it's probably because of the online conversation. Unfortunately, there's a lot of fandom warring and I yeah. hate it. I hate it, man. It, it's, it's not helpful, right? No. Uh, but it is free advertising, which is why I've decided, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not even going to watch the Lord of the Rings show, but I decided I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, because I am not advertising for Amazon. Um, you know, I just don't want to do it. And um, that's why I didn't, I did the Boba Fett talk with Mike because he wanted to do it and he asked. So, but I, I was already decided I wasn't going to do it on my own channel either, just because, you know, uh, Disney doesn't need the help. So, um, you know, it's fine. Uh, and and yeah, like inevitably you're going to pit these things against each other because then you can galvanize a bunch of free marketing. And it's um, it, it's just uh, for this to be what art is reduced to really breaks my heart. So I, I don't I don't like to do that, uh, you know, and I was going to say something, but it's gotten away from me. Oh, oh, it's I wanted to answer Chase's question about the outlines. Here yes, yes. How awesome. specific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're as specific as they need to be. Um, the outlines for like Howling Dark, the outline was like 70 pages long. Uh, and that was like single space. So it was pretty substantial. Like the outline was longer than like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Wow. Um, but I'm not writing for anyone to see that. So that writing is a lot easier than, you know, trying to get it right. 
Uh, and so some chapters might just be like a third or half a page of notes. It'll say, you know, in this scene, Hadrian and whoever else is with him will do this, this, and this. Uh, keep in mind, you know, this subplot is moving. And so like wink at that, uh, you know, set up for this in two chapters, whatever, right? Some chapters might be two pages. Um, you finish Howling Dark, right? You can probably guess which chapters those were. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, depending, you know, I, I just give as much attention to um, the chapters or the scenes as they really need. Some don't need that much because it's just about one thing. And that one thing might be, you know, an emotional moment or it might be a, a, a battle scene. Believe it or not, fight scenes get very little outlining uh, unless it's like logistics because they don't really need anything else. Um, you know, but uh, it, it just sort of depends. But by the time the book's done, it's, it's pretty long. It's like 70, 80 pages. Wow. Um, and so I, I even outline short stories now. Those are usually like two page outlines, but, uh, you know, if even, but it really, it really helps. Cause that way I'm never stuck on what I need to do hmm. uh, or where I need to go. I'm only ever just procrastinating. Uh, so so uh, when I hear 70 pages, uh, and obviously that's a big book, right? Um, what is the first thing you do when you're sitting down to outline? Like, how do you get the ball rolling? Okay, so I usually know where I want to start uh, because before I even outline, I've got uh, like a letter that I wrote myself, and it's usually uh, it's usually like uh, like three or four pages long, and it's just a description. It's sort of like the uh, the, the summary videos that I've got on uh, on my channel where I just will explain the plot of Empire of Silence, which I love. Thank you. Uh, yeah, they're getting a little too long. They're not useful as summaries anymore, uh, but the books are getting shorter. <laughs> Uh, so you know, there's that at least, uh, but I, I'll have this like four or five page letter to myself that'll, that'll just detail the plot. Like I'm writing a script treatment basically. And then I'll turn that into the outline. So I start an even lower resolution. And before I even get to that, I've got, uh, sort of my wish list. I've got like, a uh, hmm. underneath this mat here, I've got a sheet of paper. That's got a bunch of little, um, just little pink sticky notes, like these little guys. And each one of those is a thing that I want in the book. I don't know where. Mm -hmm. And I'll move those around until I get a sequence and I'll turn that into the letter and into the outline. So I know where I want to start. And the first thing I do is chapter one, which I usually already have an idea for. Um, and that'll come in the case of like, uh, in, some, in the case of some of the books I've known what the first chapter is for a while, uh, particularly uh, this next one, which was going to be the first chapter of the last book. I've, I've known basically since the beginning. I know uh, I've known that I wanted this one here. Um, and some of them I have to figure out demon and white. I had the end for, but I didn't have like the first two acts at all. When I sat down to start working on it, I needed oh. to figure out where I needed to go. Uh, because I, um, I had the ending of the series already. Cause I mentioned it on the beginning of the first book and I had the beginning, but there's a lot in the middle. I hadn't worked out. So a lot of the outlining has been about untangling things. So I knew along the way I had certain scenes, um, uh, brethren, for example, won't be too specific. Uh, I knew that was going to be in there. There's a Colosseum scene in book three that I knew I wanted. Um, there's some stuff in book four I knew had to happen, but I didn't have the connective tissue. So a lot of the outlining has been trying to take these little random ideas and kind of put them on a line with all the other ones and kind of, uh, you know, uh, mortar them into place. Yeah, it kind of becomes problem solving in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is... Probably my least favorite part of the process, but I say that about whatever part of the process is next. So if we did this in like three months, I'd be like, writing is a pain in the ass. Uh, you know, and, and then it's always copy editing. I hate copy editing. Uh, that sucks. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but despite that, the whole thing is, is still, you know, it, it's, it's worth doing. So. Yeah. And, and you're an editor as well. So do you, um, how many times, like you finish your rough draft, how many times would you say you go over something that you've written? Um, so outlining reduces that by a lot because I, I don't need to worry about moving things around too much. Mm -hmm. um, so usually, and I've also always been on a time crunch to get these things out in time um, uh, because there are other people involved in the process and, and they, uh, they may take a little bit longer than anticipated. Uh, sometimes. And so I have ever, I think Empire of Silence was the most, and I think I went back and forth four times uh, wow. with my editor, um, which is a lot less than some people, uh, but it is a lot more than some others. 
Um, Demon and White, I think I only went through once. Um, so, uh, uh, by, and I should say too, Empire of Silence wasn't outlined. It was the only one that wasn't because I learned to outline oh. on book two because at that point I was a professional and I was on a schedule. Uh, I hadn't sold book one, so I had a theoretically infinite amount of time to write it. So I just kind mm -hmm. of tinkered for three years. Uh, but after that, you know, they expect you to move pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, unless, you know, you're already bringing in millions of dollars, then it's, you know, take your time. <laughs> Do what you uh, want. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as a, as a working author, uh, they were like, so, um, you know, two months. Okay. You know, uh, and like, okay, yeah, we'll make it work. So that's um, such a different process. Like, you know, like you said, you had, you could, you could take 80 years, to write a book if you wanted to, uh, and then being on a deadline. What, what, what did that feel like? Uh, it was, I was pretty nervous about it, right? Cause it's sort of the yeah. sophomore slump thing in this kind of in art generally. And I, I wanted to be more of a black Sabbath's paranoid, uh, you know, <laughs> and less of a, I'm trying to think of an actual sophomore slump here and I'm drawing a blank. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to it really hit it out of the park with number two. So I was like, let's do this seriously. Uh, you know, let's, let's actually develop a method here. And so I, I a lot of it was uh, dedicated to sitting down and figuring out where I wanted to go, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and figuring out a plan. So I figured out a well, plan about how I wanted to have a plan, right? There was this whole yeah. extra step of learning, really learning how to be a writer that came with book two, because I needed to learn how to work on a schedule and, uh, and things like that. So. Do you feel like uh, the new, like the, kind of a new approach that you had to take to writing? Do you think it would have benefited you to be already doing that prior to book? Like, if you could go back, would have you have done Empire of Silence like that? I uh, totally, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think that uh, you know. I, I think Empire of Silence turned out pretty well, but I think if I, that, I yeah. if I were to redo it now, it would be better. I mean, that goes. I think that goes without saying for like basically every writer. I think. I remember correctly, Jim Butcher's first book like has never seen the light of day. Like there's a whole other one no one knows about. Uh, and Gene Wolfe actually pulled his first novel, Operation Aries. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was never reprinted. Um, so it's hard to find. And it's apparently like pretty bad. So like he pulled it for a reason. Um, <laughs> so this, this happens from time to time. Um, I don't think that I'm in any danger of needing to do that necessarily. No. Um, but I do think that you know, it would be an interesting experiment one time, 10 years out, if I wanted to do a new translation of, uh, of Hadrian's text and, uh, and clean things up a little. Uh, that would be kind of a cool, cool thing to do. Um, and to also deliberately introduce some contradictions so people have something to fight about. Because uh, <laughs> uh, those, uh, those fights are fun, right? If it's trying to figure out what's actually going on and you know, as long as it's, you know, it's uh, an internal argument instead of uh, Star Trek versus Star Wars, which is silly, right? They're not comparable one. And also, you know, in the, if we're having that argument in the 80s, Star Wars, uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Somebody clip it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Trekkies are going to be mad. Now it's, you know, I don't even, I don't even know, man. Uh, but, uh, but if it were 85, uh, come on. <laughs> Well, the reason why I asked you uh, if that process would have been beneficial is more so for the people who are listening that want to write. Uh, maybe having some sort of routine and schedule for yourself, even if no one's holding it to you, maybe that's a, maybe that's a good way to go. I think that I would benefit from that. And I think that's one yeah. of the biggest hangups that I have when it comes to writing is I get to taste kind of mosey along. You know, yeah. I strongly believe that basically uh, anybody uh should everybody should outline i think that anybody who doesn't probably would be better if they did up mm -hmm. to and including writers who are bigger and more famous than me i just yeah. i just think that it would improve everybody's focus and planning and time if nothing else it would help save time um but you know you need to figure out what works for you and if you really really feel like it doesn't work for you to outline then then don't do it but if you also find that you're you're convinced you're not an outliner right and you're also still not writing and it's not working for you, maybe try it because why not? Yeah, exactly. A lot of people have conceptions about themselves that are not necessarily true. Right. And, uh, Oh, and we that, lie to ourselves we, all the time. Yeah. That was one for me. I thought it wasn't necessary. I never outlined a college essay in my life. Um, so <laughs> uh, these are a bit longer. So I, I've learned my lesson. Um, uh, I have to know, 
in your outlines, do you plan your chapter endings? Because I, I have went on record to say I think you're the best chapter ender in the game, like in the entire in, in fiction. I have never met anyone or read anyone rather um, that ends chapters quite like you do. Uh, well, thanks. Um, and some of them, some of them, yes. Some of them it's not called for. Um, you know, mm -hmm. some chapters, that's the thing that really you want to hang the chapter on, right? Is is the ending. Some of them you need to open strong. Um, and um, and usually for me, right, it's <laughs> there's uh, always this sense that I've like, like just dragged myself over the finish line with a chapter because some of them I'll get stuck in. There, there's there's one in book five. Uh, that I was stuck in for like two weeks and I just wanted it out. And when I finally got to the end, it really, it landed on this really solid kind of wham note. And I was like, we're done. I am just not writing anymore. And uh, I think, uh, I think it was exactly the right place. And sometimes uh, my great grandmother used to say uh, about eating that when it tastes the best stop. Oh, and uh, uh, which I think is great. Uh, maybe not true advice, you know, with food, right. Cause maybe you should, you know, eat the rest of the pie. Yeah, um, I want to be rude. But yeah, it would be it would just be it would be rude not to. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but with writing, I find that like if I'm like okay, that's exactly like I'm feeling really good about that line. I just move on. Um, yeah. Sometimes you go back and add more stuff, but it's usually um, I usually find doing that ends up making things a little more meandering. Yeah. Um, and the book has enough of that anyway. So. <laughs> oh, I don't think I, I I don't think it meanders at all. And if it is, I'm enjoying it. Uh, well, it's, uh, well, Hadrian at least meanders. Yeah. <laughs> he's no. great. No, well, thanks. He's very dramatic. Uh, I've heard that about him, and everybody um, knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Ask anybody who knows him. Uh, yeah, if I didn't do that, people wouldn't buy the character either. You know, yeah. I, people are too ironic now. Nobody's sincere, so uh, you know you gotta you gotta lean on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, that actually is something that Steven Erickson also said about chapter endings. Like you, you'll know when it's over and then like just end it, like just end the chapter. Uh, and I like that the whole, like when it tastes best, like make that your last bite. Uh, cause in wrestling, a lot of times people try to one up themselves during their match, like the highest point of crowd reaction. A lot of times the guys will lose it. Uh, cause they try to do too much after whenever they should have just went out with the simple, the simple thing instead of the totally and if, thing. if you're not careful half thor bjornson will poke your eyes out exactly uh, so you, you can't you gotta you gotta end it where it's where it's done you know uh fremen style attitude of the knife yeah um, so 100 percent online Dayton's uh had a question said i wonder if uh rockio has considered an eventual 10 year special edition of empire sign sun eater which adds hadrian sketches for illustrations in the book that's a cool idea yeah. Oh, you bet I have. Uh, if I had my way, they would have had sketches the whole time. But, uh, you know, art is expensive. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I hadn't quite earned my stripes yet. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, whether or not it's a 10th anniversary edition or something or if it's uh, uh, even sooner, if it's just a collector's edition of some kind, because, uh, you know, we, we may be doing those. Uh, you know, uh, I would love to add the illustrations, you know, art, getting art from other people is my, my favorite part of this process. And you've sent me two drawings here, Dayton. So, you know, uh, how much that made my day, but getting like the covers from Kieran is my favorite official part of the, of, of the whole process, because it, it's like being handed back a little piece of my own imagination from somebody else. Wow. And, uh, it, it, unless they get it wrong then it's, then it's like, Oh gosh, no. Um, you know, then it's really upsetting, but, uh, Kieran's never hit anything other than a home run. So, uh, you know, I, I've just been, it's been really exciting every single time. So no more art would be great. Uh, I would love to do that. Um, I just really hope that, um, you know, I, I hope that we get to do it. That'd be really yeah. cool. Yeah. I think, I think everyone that uh, has read and enjoyed the book would absolutely love to see that. Um, and I think that's a pretty neat way of tying it into oh. Hadrian's story and, and what he's doing with those sketches. I think that's pretty excellent. Uh, Brent says, I'm so happy to see more and more people finding this amazing series. I'm happy both for Christopher Rocchio and for everyone who gets to experience these bangers for, for the first time. So Brent uh, has been around coming on the channel for a long time. Uh, Scott, who you know, the bald book tuber, and then Alex Neveas are the key components of me starting this series they have been ambassadors for you and sun eater um so big thanks to them because i'm so glad that i finally pulled the trigger i really am 
you know, well, thanks, Brent. Uh, I can't remember if it was you or Brad as uh, the B names, but uh, if that was another one out of the thousand, well done. Uh, <laughs> either it was either Brent or Brad who I said needed to get a th like a thousand more people to read the book so that we could get more hardcovers. <laughs> Everybody wants the hardcovers. I, I was very fortunate uh, to find one. Um, yeah, I, I wish they would print more. I've been trying. It's a process. Well, we'll see if we can get the mob going and see if we can make it happen. Um, this is a question from John. It says, uh, question for Chris. What tips would you give to a new writer who wants to improve their prose? That's the hardest thing for me when I write. Oh, this one is actually super easy. Uh, so there is a website called Silva Rhetorica, uh, S-I-L-V-A uh, Rhetorica, H-R-R-H-E-T-O-R-I-C-A. -R -R it's, I think, part of BYU's uh, website. And uh, what they've got is a kind of dictionary of rhetorical structures and devices. Uh, and nobody teaches rhetoric anymore. It used to be one of the like fundamental subjects of like classical education and like philosophy, it's just gone. Uh, we don't teach to anybody anymore. And, um, and so what I would do is I would go look through their index of rhetorical devices and you'll see things like, uh, like, like tricolon, right? Which is when you have a series of three things, uh, you know, just like red comma blue comma and green, um, you know, or, or something like that. And then write like five to 10 sentences of like each device, right? Just practice writing sentences with these structures because these structures hmm. are structures that uh, like grammarists and rhetoric rhetoricians and people for centuries have sort of determined sound good in the English language. And maybe there's some arbitrariness to that, but uh, at the same time, it sounds, I think, objectively good to the English speaker's ear. And so practicing writing those little, uh, those little structural, grammatical structural techniques, uh, just keep a little journal, like do, you know, hmm. do like five a day um, and just come up with like random sentences for like each one so that you uh, not only like learn how to do them, but like learn what they are in the first place. Right. Yeah. Uh, because this is the sort of stuff that like Shakespeare would have done in like grade school when he was because like 12, they would have made him write these sentences. Um, and so you can like learn how to get these, uh, these things, um, how to use these things and they'll start to come to you naturally. You'll, you'll think, Oh, it's time to do, you know, an example of Hendiades or something. Cause that would sound really good here. Uh, and they all also have crazy Greek names. So it's like you're learning magic, which is a nice bonus, <laughs> uh, you know, so that's cool. Uh, and, uh, and so no, that the silver rhetorica is really, really helpful. Uh, I discovered that, uh, one of my college professors mentioned it offhand. It wasn't even like part of the assignment. So I went and read that and learned all the Greek incantations. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I did that for, um, a little while, um, because like I said, r rhetoric is like totally just dropped as a subject. Nobody teaches it anymore. Uh, and it's really, cause like, you, like most of us already know like how to tell a story, right? If only like to our friends at the bar, it's really like polishing that, that most people lack. It's developing a voice and a style. And so focusing on the minutiae of like sentence construction like that and actually learning some formal sentence construction uh, is, is really, really helpful. I would also read your work out loud when you're done to yourself, to mm -hmm. an audience, have someone read it back to you if they're willing, because not only will you hear what sounds dumb because it will sound dumb. Your ear is smarter than you are. Uh, you will also catch a lot of typos that way, which is super, super useful. Yeah. So, uh, I still do that. It takes forever, but I still do that. Um, that's a, that's probably some of the most unique advice and some of the most useful advice. I'm definitely going to check that out. That's really awesome. I, uh, I've definitely read my stories out loud when I've, <laughs> sometimes you read out loud, like, what was I trying to say? Like, Me too. Is... Still, you know, it's, it never goes away. <laughs> so Philip says it's true. Uh, rhetoric is rarely taught in college these days, but a few of us bring it up when we can. Philip is a, uh, a professor and uh, a great one at that. Well, one, cool. of the, one of the people still fighting the good fight. So we appreciate you, Philip, for sure. Awesome. Um, that's that's some really really great advice. I, I've seen your prose described as sublime. Um, I always say it just feels so smooth to read. Um, I, I I kind of get lost as I keep going, and then I end up two hundred pages later. And that's a really masterful thing of being able to say something very very like powerful without 
reaching for a bunch of ten dollar words, you know, and being able to kind of what's what's sort of looking for kind of to make it accessible, uh, but not in a way where I feel like it's reduced or anything like that. But it's just so easy to read while still having so much value. Well, I'm really glad that it's uh, that it's working for you um, because I do worry about being overwrought sometimes. There's some people oh, who no. think that I'm, you know, trying to trying to impress them or something like that. I'll catch hmm. a couple of reviews to that effect every now and then. Um, and because, uh, of course, there are some there's some obscure words in there. Right. I, but I really do think a lot of it's down to uh, mostly having listened to audiobooks. Uh, that's how I do most oh. of my reading and always have. I had the. I had the Lord of the Rings CDs back in the in the '90s. I still have them somewhere. They're all beat to hell. Uh, <laughs> but the old uh, the old uh, Robert Inglis recordings, which are wow. great. Uh, I must have listened to. Uh, uh, sorry, read, uh, listened to Lord of the Rings like a hundred times in my life. Wow. Um, and so, like, good writing like sounds good, right? Like that's mm -hmm. that's the the thing about it. And uh, silent reading is a really like new invention. People didn't do that. Uh, people always read aloud. There are anecdotal stories about Julius Caesar reading silently to like freak people out. Like it was like a weird thing people did. People really? Always, oh yeah. No, people would like read communally. Like they like someone would have the book, whether it was scripture or poetry or whatever, and they would read to an audience and they would share the book that way. And that was wow. mostly how reading was done in uh, throughout history. Uh, reading like as a solitary pursuit and reading silently was a really new development in, in, in how humans relate to text. And so that tradition of reading out loud is still kind of in our DNA, I think, maybe in like an actual like Dune, you know, in our DNA kind of way. Yeah. And so I think that, that writing with the expectation that you're going to be heard um, is also right. something uh, that you should keep in mind, right? Not just as you read aloud yourself to practice, but just in general. Um, I, I tend to think a lot about how the words sound as I'm writing them. I, I don't listen to music when I write because I need to hear myself talk. Um, and so I have a very, uh, I'm a very auditory person anyway, I have virtually like no visual processing at all. Uh, you know, I, and so like most of what I, I am writing about, I'm, I'm thinking about as language and not as, you know, like I'm seeing this picture of a castle. I have to, I have to describe the castle in my head to even see it. So I don't have a strong, uh, you know, visual thing. I struggle with that as well. Uh, and, and some, pe some people will comment on my videos cause I'll mention reviews, you know, if something has a ton of descriptions and they're not, that I'm not being able to imagine a lot of the stuff. Uh, and people are like, how do you read? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I don't have a lot of images going through my dome. Maybe it's from the concussions. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. well, I can't speak to the concussions. So, I mean, it could just be, it could just be, you know, natural though. Uh, yeah. Someone here is saying that uh, that silent reading appears in the Middle Ages, the 13th, 15th centuries. There we go. Yeah, it's a little bit earlier than I thought it was off the top of my head. Uh, but uh, but yeah, relatively recently. That's like no time relative to the invention of literacy, right? So Yeah, yeah, that, it's, it's definitely new. That's recent yeah. uh, for sure. It's 10 uh, and, seconds in biological time. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, Sun Eater audiobooks are amazing. I would agree with Nick. Uh, I am just so blown away, away by, uh, Samuel's work on the audiobooks. Uh, I would almost say that the most prime experience would be the audiobooks. I, I really enjoy it. I do immersive reading, so I actually follow along as I listen to the book. It just gets me really into the work. Uh, but he is fantastic. Did you have a hand in picking him or is there like, how does that work? Yeah. So it, it can work a few ways. I, I did pick. Uh, John Lee for the UK recording. They asked me if I had anybody I wanted, and they gave me a couple a uh, couple options. And I, I John Lee wasn't one of them. And I asked, you know, can could we maybe try John Lee? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. Um, but uh, recorded books just picked uh, uh, Sam Roken for me, and uh, and that was that was it, right? You know, in the same way I said earlier, usually you're just handed, uh, you know, you're handed a cover and you're expected to be grateful. Uh, I've had no reason to be anything but. Uh, he's been awesome. I think Empire of Silence was his first full-blown novel. Um, really? Uh, I think. Because I, I remember when he just started, I went to go listen to like a sample because I got the name, but I, I – because they called me and said, hey, you know, he's going to read the book, and uh, we need to get you uh, – we need to get a pronunciation guide from you basically, uh, which is very long. 
every single time. <laughs> uh, every single time. Oh my gosh. Um, they make me pronounce all the CLs and, and uh, oh man, I'm not a native speaker. So it, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't come easily to me. And so, uh, and so no, I, I went and looked him up and he only had like a couple of Brandon Sanderson novellas. And I think he was one narrator among many in another book. Uh, and I think at the time, Empire Silence was his first full-blown novel. If he's wrong, someone – if I'm wrong, someone correct me, but I think that's true. Well, uh, And so, no, he just sort of uh, – just sort of uh, was handed to me by recorded books. They've been great, um, and he's been great to work with too. Oh, he's, um, he's fantastic. So. He is Hadrian. Like when I hear Hadrian, that's what I hear. Because uh, sometimes I don't have the audio, right, and I'm just reading. Uh, I hear his voice in my head. Uh, when I read it. And I think that's just so fantastic. Uh, it's like kind of here. Great audio narr uh, narrator can elevate a book while a poor one can butcher it. And I've had that happen as well. I've had some fabulous books where I, I try to lean into the audio and I'm like, Ooh, that doesn't work. But this just, Oh man. And you're writing, like you said, you, you, you're listening to it. Right. So obviously your writing complements that very, very well. Yeah. Uh, like I said, that's really important to me. So that was that was something I, I kind of aimed at. Um, I've always had this philosophy that the writing needs to sound good. I don't know where I got it from. Um, I think it must have just been all of those audiobooks. Yeah. Um, I mean, you were listening to audiobooks when I would say that that wasn't like a main way of, of consuming the media, right? Yeah. Oh, no. I used to check out CD collections from the library and then burn the CDs <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that I had them. I still have a huge collection of stuff I kind of boosted from the library because, uh, of course, they, nobody like nobody knew you could do that. It was like 2005. Yeah, you were a uh, wizard if you could do it. Yeah. So um, and uh, and my dad is a wizard as far as computers are concerned. So it was like, oh, yeah, no, like, how long do you have it? Like two weeks, whatever. Like, we'll, we'll get it done. We'll take them right back. Um, so uh, <laughs> probably shouldn't admit to that, but, you know, it's OK. I think you're um, past. It's 2005. No one no one's paying attention. It's all good. That, that's a forgivable time period, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think we're <laughs> I think we're safe now. <laughs> have you listened to the uh, the new Lord of the Rings? narration from Andy. Serkis. I'm listening to them right now. Uh, and I mean, obviously Andy Serkis is great. He's, he's one of my favorite actors. So I, I'm, I'm in book four. So I'm in the back half of two towers, uh, which used to be my least favorite part of, of Lord of the Rings, but because he's Gollum, right. It's, it's, it's kind of popped up a little bit on, on the reread. I do find myself though, in places where he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, enunciate a sentence exactly the same way as Rob Inglis. I'm like, mm, that's, that's not right. <laughs> um, and I, I, I do think there's still virtues to the old Inglis recording that I think has it at least come out in a tie with the new circus ones. Um, yeah. uh, but I, I know my mother could never listen to that recording because she, she listened to um, uh, Harry Potter with me as a kid. Uh, so did my dad, we listened to those at dinner actually uh, <laughs> growing up. Uh, and it was the only time we were all in one place to sort of listen to the book. And, um, and then, uh, my mother moved a, a, to Aragon with me. She got, re she got more into those than I ever did. Uh, but she wouldn't listen to Lord of the Rings. She hated the Rob English recordings. And so I got these. So she would finally, you know, listen to the damn books. She hasn't yet to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but, uh, but I've been listening to them. They've been great. Yeah, I, I've only heard uh, great things. I, I actually started a reread of Lord of the Rings last year, and I put it on hold because everything else happening and all these other books I'm reading, and I've read them so often. But I, I need to do Return of the King, and I'm going to do a circus, I think, because uh, I was just reading them. I have the uh, the Alan Lee Illustrated Editions, which are just gorgeous. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to do like that immersive read through with circus in my ears, you know, reading through and checking out Alan Lee's illustrations. Yeah, no, they're great. It's great. Um, yeah. And I, and he goes full Gollum, but if you do go back, his Tom Bombadil, like literally had me rolling because he just sort of shouts every single line and he's kind of like tunelessly musical. He kind of sings even the regular dialogue in like the most <laughs> atonal, like can't carry a tune way. And it just, it was just a delight that, that really, really set it over the top for me. It was All right. Maybe I'll just do the whole trilogy uh, again. Why not? Yeah. I'll just get chapter just so you can see because it was uh, it was amazing. I I had to like pause it and then go tell my friend who's also a big Tom Bombadil respecter. Uh, you know, I was like, you have to go listen to this right now. Uh, go get an Audible account if you don't have one. It's mandatory. I love Tom Bombadil. 
Uh, he's he's so great. He's one of those things that grows on me every single time I read the books. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand him any better, you know, <laughs> except for the fact that like this is clearly like he, he's he really is one of Tolkien's like oldest characters. And so it's almost like a like a like a self fan service thing Tolkien put in there. And there's just something magical about that. But yeah. I don't I don't I don't really get what he's doing, you know, for the story that much. But boy, it's it's just it's just so much fun. So is there a, is there a Tom Bombadil equivalent maybe in Sun Eater? Or? It's funny you ask. Uh, yeah, actually, it's Dimitri, the pirate, uh, is probably the single oldest character in the entire series. He's been around since like seventh grade. Uh, <laughs> it's awesome, man. More or less unchanged, at least in terms of his behavior and his appearance and things. Um, but uh, not a, not a very big character by any means, not a particularly obtrusive one. Uh, but he's he's survived the most uh, revisions in some form or other. Wow. Um, he wasn't a pirate originally; he was a nobleman. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, he has otherwise survived attacked. So they say he started out lifting library books on a CD uh, ROM. That's what they that say. you know you have to start somewhere. Set him um, down a life of crime. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a bleak path, but somebody's got to walk it. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have to say, I find your enthusiasm and admiration for Tolkien to be pretty infectious. Like just hearing, I mean, I love Tolkien, but uh, to hear you talk about it. Uh, and every, you know, everyone's somehow inspired generally if they're writing in this genre by Tolkien, right? What about that inspired you? Like, what, what about? Tolkien do you love I, I mean it, it's hard to boil down to one thing right mm -hmm. uh, Tolkien and I share um, uh, a similar worldview we're both Catholics so I, I think that's a part of it because I, I have similar feelings about Wolf um, and um, and even Herbert used to be Catholic so that was this weird thing where like mm -hmm. the, this this sort of cult, shared cultural heritage I think plays a part in it um, but Tolkien's sort of sense that the, you know, that the world is getting darker all the time, but despite that, you know, the, the actions of like ordinary people, you know, doing, doing uh, ordinary things can sort of, can sort of turn it back. But, you know, he, he there's a letter, you know, he, he wrote to Christopher about, you know, the two of them always being on the losing side, right. Of like, you know, of, of progress, right. And things like that. It's sort of a, a romantic sort of, I don't want to say defeatism that I really empathize with because I feel like the world is getting away from us. As human beings, and that's something that um, that's something that that Tolkien's work is very much about, right? It, it's 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 about the disenchantment of, of the world, right? And that's kind of why I'm trying to do the reenchanting stuff we were talking about, um, because you know we don't have to we don't have to live this way, uh, and um, and and so I feel a deep sort of uh, uh, philosophical connection to him, um, and also I I, I just. You know, he's, he's one of the writers that everybody feels this need to tear down, uh, you know, whether it's because his imitators are, you know, there are too many of them or they're not very good or fantasy needs to get away from, uh, you know, Tolkien's shadow or whatever. Uh, I, I, I don't see why and I don't see why tearing him down is necessary. And he's constantly a target of. Oh, oh yeah. Whatever, right? People, you know, say all sorts of terrible things about him, right? Uh, and um, and I just don't get it. I don't see a need to tear down writers I don't like, uh, you know. Um, and I do think that Tolkien is probably the most important writer of the 20th century. I think that Lord of the Rings may be the only book published between 1900 and 2000 that people are going to read in 2000 years. Um, I I would love to know if I'm right. But there's just something about it that makes me feel that way. Uh, I think because it's so contrary to so much of the cynicism uh, that was that was published in the 20th century and so much of the ugliness. Um, but it, um, you know, it, it, I do still think that it's better than it had its shoulders better than the rest of fantasy. Wow. Uh, and and, um, and I know that like there are people who. Like feel like when I say that I'm attacking George Martin or, or anything, I'm totally not. Like these are perfectly great books. I just think Lord of the Rings has a certain je ne sais quoi that uh, that makes it better and more enduring. And, and I, I do think that that sort of 
uh, positive, that optimism in the face of, you know, uh, uh, in the face of overwhelming evil, it, it, despite the fact that they, they also like everyone in Lord of the Rings thinks they're going to lose. Right. And it, it, it only works out because of an act of God, basically. Right. And there's something about that that feels true to me, too. Um, hmm. But and of course, he's also a tremendous writer. Uh, you know, everybody bangs on the uh, you talked about how green everything is all the time. That's because the beauty of the world is an important theme in that book. Guys, pay attention. Um, you know, it's it's important. Right. The, the trees literally save the day at one point. Like it's there's, it talks about it for a reason. Uh, wow. You know, yeah. Uh, so even the things people criticize him for are things he did on purpose, you know, <laughs> which is not something that can be said of most writers, myself included. Uh, anyway, uh, end rant. Um, no, I think that I think that was wonderful. Uh, yeah, I just love him. So, yeah, that's awesome. And uh, I think that's I, it's obvious, like it's very sincere coming from you. And uh, it's nice to hear you know why because a lot of people say, oh tolkien you know and herbert and, and these are names that we hear all the time but to actually hear someone break it down and what resonated with them with the writing i think also can help other people who know that they love tolkien's work uh figure out why because i still struggle with that i review books all the time you know i mean i read a lot a lot lot and there's still times where i'll read a book and i'll go i don't know why but i love this piece of work so when i hear other people break down their favorites I think it helps me have a better mindset of how I can break down the things that I enjoy as well. So, yeah, well, we all have thoughts that we haven't like mapped. Right. Yeah. And so if other people like have a little map fragment, right. You know, or a compass or whatever, right. To carry the analogy too far. It, it usually helps. I'm someone who has to like talk about my own thoughts. Yes. You know, to, in order to figure them out, which drives my wife insane. My wife yeah. has to deal with it all the time. Uh, Cause <laughs> Cause like, I'll finally figure out what she's like, you've been, you, you've been mad for like two weeks. What is your problem? And then like, I'll be like, I don't know. And then we'll talk about it for like an hour and then we'll click. And I'm like, I figured out what my problem is. And she's like, Oh, now, you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. We had to talk about it. I'm sorry. It's the process. Do you ever argue Respect with yourself? The process. No. Do you ever uh, argue what? with yourself? Oh yeah. Uh, Out loud. I, I do it all the time. Yeah. It's, it's also part of the process. I, I talk to myself <laughs> in the first person plural. Uh, like it's getting worse. Like I'm actually turning into Gollum. Uh, I'm over here like, okay, like what are we going to do about this scene? Okay. Or even like normal stuff. I'm like, okay, we got to go to the store and then we uh, we're coming back and we're going to put the groceries away and then we're going upstairs. Um, uh, and so it's, it's getting out of hand. Uh, it's actually funny because I did that right before this. I said, okay, I, I need to take a shower. Then we're going to do this. And then we're going to do that. That th I do the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, and if I don't, I get lost. It's uh, it's reassuring that I'm not alone or that we're not alone. Um, so. <laughs> uh, I'm looking here. Hunter said, and being negative can be good. Elsewise, things can go too far it's not tearing down an author to criticize and well I, I i think i i think i know exactly what you're meaning whenever you're talking about tearing something down is people like to dismiss everything an author has done uh based on what they feel is the truth about that um and i've seen actually i, I saw this happen on a really large twitter thread um it was an author i'm not familiar with um i, I don't really know who they are but they were just tearing down george R. R. martin like bad and uh, basically just dismissing his work as like rubbish. And uh, to me, it was just like one of the most astounding things to read because I'm just like, what reality do you live in? Uh, whether or not you resonate with the message or you like the writing or any, you don't have to like it. But to then deny the influence that it's had is just kind of silly. And I've seen people do it with Tolkien a ton. Yeah, well, people need to sometimes stand on another person's neck to be a little bit taller. Uh, and I have been short all my life and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> by me so uh, i i don't i don't get it um there are plenty of writers that i don't think very much of and you know i, I think a lot about tolkien's note on doom because tolkien didn't like doom uh i did and, not know this i didn't know yeah that. there's a little note uh where he, he i can't remember what it's from but he, he says that you know oh thank you for sending me a copy of dune i already had one i read it uh you know i uh something about uh, detesting it uh quite intensely or something like that uh, but I don't feel it's appropriate for me to to comment on, you know, uh, other writers work. So I'm just not going to. Um, and um, and it was like a private note anyway. Right. So like he's wow. not being hypocritical by saying that. Um, 
but yeah, it didn't work for him. I suspect it's because Herbert is very cynical about heroism, uh, in exactly the you know exactly the way we were just talking about, uh, and and so I think that just didn't sit well with Tolkien, and um, it's something I'm kind of sympathetic, uh, you know, with Tolkien about. As I as I reread Dune, I I I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the information that like you know. Uh, pivotal historical figures are kind of a mixed bag. Like, of course they are. Uh, but like, what were the Fremen supposed to do? Live under the Harkonnens? Like, uh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that, uh, and that was sort of one of the germs for the series too, is that this idea that these great figures of history, you know, are uh, intrinsically bad and dangerous, and we should be very skeptical of heroes, um, isn't anything other than like a step one like what do you do next right and and i was like okay i hear you frank you're not wrong but like we probably still need someone to deal with the problems that we have right and i don't know that like like if you look at history um there are a lot of like mute processes that like determine how things happen right like like uh uh, diseases, obviously, being a particularly relevant one. But if you look at other things, too, like um, like, like famine was the big thing in the 70s, right? Everybody was afraid we were going to starve. And then there, I can't remember his name. And I've mentioned this guy like eight times. Someone in the comments always has to tell me. But there's a guy who single-handedly, like, developed a new strain of wheat that, like, solved the, the like, world grain problem and, like, basically averted – the uh, the famine and the overpopulation crisis that everybody was worried about in the 70s. He did it by himself. It was one guy. And history is often turned around by the actions of a single person. And, and there's and we have a tendency maybe in our culture to like overemphasize military victories, right, at the expense of, say, scientific or religious sure. ones or whatever. Uh, but like individual people really matter. Like every individual person matters because it doesn't – you have no idea like who's going to be – the Paul Atreides, right? Who's going to be the guy with the wheat or who's going to be uh, Pope Leo the third convincing Attila the Hun to randomly not sack Rome. Uh, you know, like just, we have no idea what he said, but went out to talk to him and Attila left. Like, I don't know what that's about, but that's awesome. Uh, you know, and I think it was Leo the third. It's one of the Leos. Leo the first. Leo the third was Charlemagne. Um, <laughs> you know more than me. <laughs> Too many of them. Uh, I think it's Leo the first. Anyway, um, you know, like, like history always really hin history always hinges on some random person's shoulders, right? And uh, you know, and it could be it could be anybody at, at any given moment. And, and so, wanting to to sort of reconstruct Norman Borlaug. Thank you. I've done this every single time. This poor man's name will not stick in my head. Poor Norman. Um, it's because his name is Norman. Yeah, that must have been it. Uh, I can't get past Osborne. Um, but yeah, I, I, seriously, like the fourth time I've done this now, and I can't remember him. It's it's like it's, I, I keep getting confused about Jonas Salk, right? The polio vaccine guy. Another person who deserves to go on the list. Uh, you know, he, he absolutely like changed the course of, of human history. Yeah. And so and so with Hadrian, I kind of wanted to reconstruct what Frank was deconstructing and doing, hmm. right? I wanted to try and put heroes back together because we've deconstructed the hero story so much in 2022 uh, that if we're not careful, there's like going to be like no, there are going to be no constructions to, uh, to like shelter under when we need to take shelter in, in, in constructions anymore. We'll have deconstructed everything. Uh, and so I wanted to try and put the idea of, of the hero story back together, but in like a steel man kind of way, right? Because Hadrian's not a simple person. No, uh, and the story no, no. Isn't, isn't simple or easy either. So uh, I want to try and acknowledge the um, – uh, I wanted to acknowledge Frank's critique of, you know, stories like, like John Carter, right? Because Paul and John are kind of the same, kind of the same person, right? Um, I can't remember if it was earlier in the other talk today or if it was earlier in this talk that I said that. But Yeah, um, no, it was this talk. Yeah. It was here. Okay, yep. yeah, this is the danger of having two interviews in one day. But yeah, <laughs> like, like I wanted to try and put together what Frank had taken apart again. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's kind of uh, maybe that is step two. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. You know I what I'm saying? Like, it kind of like, goes with remystifying the world, right? Yeah. You know, we have to put the hero myth back together, too. So if I have like a mission with this story, besides selling books and hoping everyone has a nice time, it's, it's to try and do that. 
Yeah. Um, I, you know, the first time I've ever, I ever saw your name, I was reading Dune and I went through the tour reread because there was a, a piece in the set back half of the book. I didn't really get, you know, and I'm like, I need this explained. Like I read over it like two or three times. I'm, like, I'm not getting this. So I found the tour reread and I see a commenter. His name's Christopher Rocchio. Uh oh, I and forgot just, I did this. Just dropping knowledge, and I was I was very very uh, happy because I I had known I knew you were an author. I knew that you had published because I heard Scott talking about all these things, and I'm like, this guy's in the comments and he knows his stuff. Uh, I thought that was just really neat uh, to, yeah. to stumble upon your comments there. I don't even remember doing that. I'm not going to be honest. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I I used to have to read Tor.com because they were doing a Vorkosigan saga reread. Uh, and I worked for Bain and my boss was like, yeah, keep an eye on that. You know, if there's something we need to share, if they want support or whatever, you know, let us know. Uh, you know, and so I was rereading that for ages and ages. And I guess I just saw the Dune thing pop up. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't remember. It was, uh, um, you were having some excellent dialogue with people. No. Um, just probably in getting into trouble. I shouldn't have been in if I had to guess. I thought it was excellent. So <laughs> all, all good on this front, my friend. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it um but yeah someone said yeah Cy over here said that it's interesting the person there's people who change history for the good or scientists it was just the first two examples that came to my mind but i did mention the pope right uh so you know it, it, it's it's all sorts of people um but those are just the two that like we, we tend to, to favor uh you know military uh stories when we tell these stories right we like yeah. we'll talk about how uh, you know, uh, if, uh, if Alexander had, you know, done something a little bit different, the battle might've, might've, uh, or Alexander generally had this huge impact, uh, in, in all sorts of dimensions. Nobody ever talks about like economics, right? Yeah. Uh, he really like, uh, helped popularize the use of coined money across Central Asia, uh, because it really was kind of an Anatolian and a, and a Persian thing. Uh, and so that's a huge thing. Just the, the popularization of coined silver. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody really talks about his, his influence on economics. So, and he was dead, uh, by the time he had that impact. So you, you never, you never really know. Uh, but I just, yeah, I, I did pick a couple scientists, but we can, we can pick all sorts of people. I mean, the most, probably the single most influential person in, in, in uh, in human history was a, a relatively anonymous carpenter from, uh, uh, Judea. So, um, and, uh, and he was just, you know, some guy. So you never, you never really know. Yeah. I, I like that. The, that individual can change the world. I mean that, that I, I would consider myself for the most part, a nihilist, but I still enjoy that message. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty optimistic and, and uh, overall it, it actually still resonates with me. I would say. I think it's true. Uh, you know, maybe that maybe I'm too optimistic, but I, I, I do think, you know, maybe it's not true of like everyone, but it could be true of anyone, which is not the hmm. same thing. Um, yeah. You know, um, there's a bit. I think it's. I think it's in book three, so maybe I shouldn't talk about it. Um, <laughs> never mind. I'll get to it next week. <laughs> uh, there's a bit in book three that speaks to this, I think. So. Um, I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled. So yeah, yeah, I'll keep my mouth shut, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, Justin here said, I asked Jimmy nuts what to read next. He said, sun eater. I can't even wait for kingdoms of death. A series of truly epic. Justin is someone I know. Uh, Justin has read like a thousand books <laughs> in fantasy and sci-fi. I mean, this, this guy has been reading for decades and, uh, I, I feel very odd giving him recommendations because he just so well read, um, and has good taste in my opinion. So I said, you know what? I think he would enjoy sun eater. Cause I knew he really loved Dune, And he came back like, only a couple weeks later and was like i finished all three. Oh my goodness you've set me on the right path you know really awesome uh stuff so just yeah no thanks um i'm really excited to see what everybody thinks about book four i think i'm gonna get a lot of very angry messages uh oh, and that no. could be fun oh no so, uh um I, uh, I that is all i'll say there I, are a few I, characters I'm really looking forward to it i think jake left already he's read it um but uh but yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's always a little nerve wracking, uh, you know, when, when the new book comes out, because I usually don't read reviews. Uh, I, I actually blocked Goodreads. It's impossible for me to read reviews. Hmm. Uh, but I still find ways to peek when the new ones come out, because you kind of want to know just the general tenor of the response. Consensus, yeah. So, 
uh, I think, I, and it's been a little while. I haven't had a new book since July, 2020. So um, it's been a while. So I, I am a little nervous to get back into it. So I, I, I expect very good things. And I know Jake uh, got an early copy and read it. And the only thing he said is like, wait till you read this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm waiting. I have some characters that if you do anything to, we're going to have a problem. Uh, so I got, I got to get through book three still, uh, which I'm going to read next week. And then the week of the release, I'll be, re I'll be reading uh, kingdoms of death, uh, awesome. which I would uh, ask who they were, but I don't know that I can keep my face that straight, I ever, so. I will not because um, I, I even thought about this prior i said i kind of want to bring up this character but i won't because i don't even want to see a facial expression or anything i just i'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty bad about uh pretty bad about that so <laughs> no I poker this, face <laughs> but uh um yeah it's, it's hard not to talk about things um you know even for <laughs> books that are already out because it's just like oh yeah let's uh because there are whole parts of, like like i've never been able to have an in-depth conversation about the quiet right uh, for example, it's just not been possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lot I want to say, uh, but it would be too soon. And it's a very difficult thing for me because I am one of those people who would like go read the article about the movie in advance so that I like knew what was going on. Uh, I, uh, I'm not a uh, spoiler reverse uh, in my, in my own person. Mm -hmm. Um, several times I have, I have, uh, pre-ruined a movie and realized that I'm going to hate it going in. Uh, and then still have the arrangement to go meet my friends to go see it. Um, my brother will not go see movies with me anymore. So, uh, <laughs> it's actually not true. We're seeing Batman next week, but he knows I'll like Batman. So, are you excited for it? Oh yeah, I, I'm a big Batman fan. He's my yeah. favorite superhero. I'm not. I'm not really a big superhero guy in general, which uh, you know is a strange thing to say, having done the Thor comic. I was but, about to say, <laughs> uh, but uh, I am a big Batman fan. I really like Daredevil. Um, cool. Thor is all right. Uh, mostly, I'm familiar with Thor as a, you know a mythological character and not as uh, uh, not as a superhero. So, um, uh, but uh, but yeah. So, no, Batman is Batman's my guy, and so I am uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be good. It's the same uh, cinematographer as the Dune movie, so it's gonna at least look awesome. So. Yeah, I'm excited to see what Robert Pattinson can do. I'm not the biggest superhero fan. I generally check out Batman stuff. Uh, for some reason, it just feels a little bit more grounded so I can get behind it. Um, I, I'm i excited to see what Robert Pattinson can do because I became a very big fan of his after the movie The King. Um, that, oh, uh, yeah. It's yeah, kind of a dismal movie, but he was my favorite part of it. I, I thought he was just fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of those battle scenes in that were like so claustrophobic. Like you're right. Like it was overall like a miss for me, but there were things about, I really liked. And one, the number one thing was him. I thought his performance was just awesome. Yeah. He was my favorite part too. Of course, Louis was not at the battle of Agincourt. So that's completely, completely <laughs> wrong. Uh, I didn't see any horses either. Uh, that was also strange. Um, that first fight was pretty good, though, between uh, between Henry and Hotspur. That was pretty solid. Um, the ending is what kills me, though, because uh, you've got uh, uh, Princess uh, uh, Catherine Valois speaking like she is from, you know, 1999 instead of, <laughs> you know, 1320-something. 13, I forget. They ran out of money for the ink on the script. They just said... Yeah, they're just like, it's fine. Yeah, she doesn't need to act like a princess of, of the House of Valois at all. Uh, you know... <laughs> very very strange left turn there at the end of the movie i just yeah man yeah it felt like um, a bit of a mess overall yeah um yeah uh but you know timothy was great i think it was the first time i ever saw him in something me too so, which is why i wanted to see it because i wanted to see how paul was going to be uh it was cool they had the little wind-up mechanical bird from constantinople though because of if you read sailing to serantium there's one in that and those were real things oh, they had these oh. little clockwork birds um that were like a curiosity of the period and so to see one in a movie was neat um, that's really cool i didn't know that yeah and i love uh i, I love those uh, Sar uh, uh Sarantian books too so yeah. one features really prominently in the plot actually two do uh and so it was just cool it was cool to think about those books again so yeah that's awesome those are two i really want to get to um among other things from ggk he's like just a really talented author and lines of Alversan. I, I read that was my first ever. Oh, guy I read. Ask, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very, very it good. It is really good. I've never seen someone make a surgery, the like climax of a book 
but it is a really yeah a really good scene yeah i really enjoyed it yeah uh he is he is always uh really really good at uh at sort of the like human emotional story uh he's really good at setting too uh he's a really nice guy i met him was it 2019 2018 uh and he remembered me from having like tweeted at him uh which was really cool really uh, yeah he's like oh yeah we spoke like a couple weeks ago and i just didn't expect that at all uh he signed my copy of a uh, song for Arbon, uh which was really cool uh, uh there are not a lot of, of writers working today I'm, I'm still like a giant like super fan of uh just because it like it feels weird uh but he he is one of them and he's a he's a real he's a real uh real nice guy um, yeah that's awesome I'd love, to, I'd love to actually sit down and talk to him uh, but, uh, but he's cool. He went to the same high school as Steven Erickson. Did he really? Yeah. Um, Erickson dropped that on us. Canadian, but yeah. Yeah. He dropped that on me and I, he's like, yeah, just like a random fact. And I was like, oh, that's wild. Uh, you know, t- t- two, two people that I happen to respect immensely just happened to go through the same, uh, the same high school. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, yeah. The only re- thing remotely similar is a magic, the gathering artist that went to my high school. Uh, Jamie Jones and I had the same art teacher. I obviously uh, didn't do as well under his tutelage. No. Uh, I'm a big Magic the Gathering fan, so that's yeah, that, that's good stuff. Yeah, I used to play. I played up through uh, Innistrad, and then it got too expensive, and I was waiting yeah. tables and didn't have time. No. Yeah, I uh, I don't play anymore. Uh, but for a while after, uh, actually, it was really after I left wrestling and I didn't know what to do with myself. And I was like, I need to find something to buy my time. And I'd always wanted to play. And I said, well, let's do it. And then yeah, it's uh, a fun game. It's a very yeah. expensive game. Uh, that, they all are increasingly. I uh, people think that I'm 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 a big Warhammer 40k guy, but I have never gotten into it in my life. Uh, it it is prohibitively expensive. Uh, and, uh, and there's too much of it. Like I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah. So, um, I have never, uh, I, I understand they have an inquisition too, but, uh, like I said, I'm Catholic. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have nothing to do with Warhammer. So, <laughs> um, and so yeah, the- I, that's, that's another one. It's just, I don't have a billion dollars. No. Right. Or yeah. That- cool Henry Cavill likes it, you know, no, there's that. No. Oh, Henry Cavill likes everything. Yeah, he kind of does. It's becoming a bit of a meme. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll be in Mass Effect. Sure, Warhammer, yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> Why not? I'm like, with what time, Henry? Um, <laughs> with what time? <laughs> and, oh, Highlander. Yeah, I really hope they make that, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would like to see Henry Cavill and Highlander. I, I would be a fan of this. I think it could be fun. Yeah, and it's supposed to be the John Wick director, so. Oh, okay. Uh, I really want to see it. Um, that would be great um yeah, but you know we'll believe it when we see it so yeah at, at this point you know what isn't announced uh besides you know a sun eater show uh, oh. <laughs> uh, i think it actually that kind of brings me to this question i saw let me see if i can find it here we go uh benjamin Khan says with the rise of sun eater on booktube has there been an explosion of interest in book four compared with previous books and i wanted to ask you about the impact booktube's had because you know this, the series is gaining more and more popularity in this little, very little corner of the internet that we have here uh, that I love so much. But has that been quantifiable for you? Uh, it has. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll be able to answer more definitively when I get the the uh, first week numbers on, on book four. Um, because pre-orders uh, are, are counted as first week sales, and I don't get those reported until week two. Okay. Um, so... I'll be able to give you a better answer then. But in terms of like helping the sales of the uh, the other books, uh, it's definitely helped. Particularly, of course, move book one because people have to read that one first. Uh, and uh, when when Mike did his first video, that was December 2020, I think, or yeah, December 2020, hmm. uh, something like that. Uh, I sold I think another like 500 more books than I usually did. Wow. Uh, in, in the course of the next like month and a half, something like that. It was a, it was a big push. Uh, and then there've been a couple weird spikes since then. And I, I don't know what to attribute those to Cause I don't know if I've like missed a video somewhere um, or if it was something else. It's, it's hard to say, but there was, there was one where it went from being like here 
to being about right here and then right back down again. There was like a like a 70 book spike one week and I, I can't figure out what caused that. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't want to be too specific about numbers, but no, you're so, fine, yeah. yeah um, but, uh, but that was weird, but it has absolutely been helping. And I, I'm sort of thinking the effect's going to be cumulative. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I've done, I think three interviews in the last week. I think that that's going to help move, move the needle a little bit. This one being, uh, being the final one. And, uh, and as we get closer to book four, I, I think that'll help as well. Uh, the new books, nothing sells old books like new books. Yeah. Uh, and so every time you get a new book, or even if a book that's out comes out in paperback, there's a huge spike uh, because the sales teams, as everything, um, the, w- the way that it works, right, is publishers have a, uh, they have a sales team that works for them. And uh, Dawes is Penguin's sales team. So it's actually part of the corporate parent company, right? And that sales team is going to have maybe a couple dozen people on it. And each one's responsible for like different outlets, right? Like there's a guy whose job it is to sell to Barnes and Noble. There's someone whose job oh. is maybe like big box stores, Walmart's targets. And then maybe one person does like military bases or airports or something like that. Cause these are all like sort of little different, uh, like, like sales portfolios. Right. And they kind of get the memo that like, these are the new books in this month. Right. So it's their job when that book is new to really push it. And in between those memos, the book is essentially like a non-issue, right? It's just out there. Like we're not like, you don't really get support uh, for a book that was out five months ago, unless it's like on the times list and is still on the times list. And want to just keep pushing it. Usually, you know, like, um, cause if you look at like the, the book scan, like top 50 science fiction books, right. Uh, it's almost always the same. It's always Dune. And it's usually like four editions of Dune. Um, <laughs> it's always Ender's game. It's always the Martian. It's always Ernest Klein. Uh, hmm. and it's always, uh, the expanse. And then the rest is star Wars. Um, uh, it's like half star Wars titles. Uh, and that basically never changes, but like maybe, you know, seven to 13 of that top 50 on a weekly basis will be new releases and they will flick in and they will fall out. Uh, yeah. And then they will be, and they will never hit that list again. So most books best and only chance of hitting any bestseller list is that first week with the pre-orders. So I'm very interested to see if we can get, you know, two, three, 4,000 pre-orders for this book. And if we get there, that's actually high enough to get pretty high on that list. Um, might not be the top spot, but it can get pretty high. Um, and I have gotten on that top 50 each time, uh, nice. for the first week. Um, and again, dropped right off, but, uh, it'll be interesting to see if we can get even higher with this one. I think we can. And if we can't, cause you know, it's been a little weird. It's been a year and a half since the last one and all the world has been a little weird. Yeah. Uh, maybe by book five, things are a little bit more normal. We've had book four out to kind of reset the foundation i think i think ash is a man could really uh could really be uh successful there at the end of the year so fingers yeah. crossed uh but i think i think booktube has been great i uh i feel very uh you know fortunate to be included in the sort of broader broader community and it's been that's been fun because i think a lot of writers i mean a lot of writers are are hilariously uh techno inept uh, which is hilarious, right? My favorite is uh, William Gibson wrote Neuromancer on a typewriter, um, which is just funny. <laughs> you know, the, the word cyberspace was coined on a typewriter. It's amazing. Um, but, you know, I, I, so I've been able to sort of, along with uh, my friend Brian Lee Durfee, right, to sort of be here. Yeah. There are a few other writers, but you know, Brandon Sanderson is a channel, but Brandon Sanderson is everything, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so I, I feel like it's been a cool, a cool thing to do. And, um, you know, I, I really like everybody, you know, I've, I've talked to, it's been a blast much better than Twitter. So um, <laughs> for, yeah. for certain yeah. on that, on that front. Yeah we, yeah. we have a pretty interesting community, you know, I mean, and depending on who's reading a book at one time, it can like catch, catch fire with these group of people who do reviews and then other ones. And, uh, there's always like niches within the niche and all this stuff. Um, but one, uh, one book that's been pretty consistent over the last year has been empire of silence. Like I just continuously see it. I made it my number one 
most anticipated just because the people like who recommended it to me, I trust them so much. Uh, and everyone was saying, this is going to be for you. Um, so it, it was pretty cool to f get a book, read it, and it live up to the hype. Uh, and I think that's been the case for a lot of the people who told me that they were going to check it out since my review, uh, which I always think is a pretty big indicator of the, of the success of what the book is setting out to do. So, yeah, uh, well, I, I am grateful and I'm really glad you enjoyed the books. Um, it, it means a lot every time someone says that. So, yeah. um, cause you know, like people talk about, I, I guess, imposter syndrome, right. Or they just talk about generally, you know, artists sort of always feel like they're, they're on the verge of failure. And it does kind of, it does feel like that sometimes. So, uh, you know, if you've got another writer and you folks like, you know, do, do tell them you like their books, it'll probably make their day. <laughs> so, um, so yeah yeah i, I thank you um, yeah absolutely i mean I, you know trying to write myself i see how much goes into this you know from, from a grand scheme it's telling a story but there are so many little things that go in uh to good works right uh, and the people who are paying attention to the details and really refining the craft uh, I have the utmost respect, obviously, uh, for anyone who's able to tell a coherent story, uh, especially whenever it has such, you know, smooth prose. Uh, and it is doing something a little bit different. You take a lot of risks in your books. I've only read two, but my goodness, you have uh, stopped my heart definitely once. And I would say more so twice. And uh, you've kind of had these characters, embodiments of ideas that I find to be very fascinating. And I, I really respect when someone takes a risk. Uh, cause it takes a lot to, especially, you know, your first big series and saying, I'm going to do something outlandish, uh, which I'm thinking of a very specific moment in Howling Dark. <laughs> and I, I was, was like, say, I think I know what you're talking about. And I'm like, what in the world? But that, that is a decision that I think a lot of people would be afraid to make. And, and you went for it. So I always respect that. Yeah. Well, in that case, maybe you'll like kingdoms of death then. Uh, Jake, I will, I think, you know, maybe, maybe he's a little upset with me, but, uh, <laughs> but if it's, it's the risk taking you like, then maybe you'll be okay. No, I'm a huge uh, fan of that. Doing something different, having a new idea or just doing something that people would generally say, Hey, whoa, don't do that. Uh, I'm a big fan of, um, and, and it's very much reflected in a lot of the works that I rant about here on, on the channel, especially for the times that they were released and things like that. Um, yeah, you, you've definitely made your way into that list. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm pretty contrary by nature. So we talked about this before we, we came on, right? With regards to the moment that you're talking about, I just saw a lot of people say I couldn't do it. Uh, like it was like actually impossible in the kind of story I was telling. So I was just like, no, go to hell. Um, it's happening, you know, um, I don't, I don't like it when people say that you can't, you can't do, uh, certain things. Especially I, I totally agree with you. So, um, whenever I was a pro wrestler, uh, you know, I would say I can have an entertaining match and not take a bump with a fall. I said, I can do a whole match. I can go 20 minutes and I won't take a fall and I, and I'll get them there. I'll get the crowd there. And, you know, people, nah, that's stupid. It'd be boring. Don't do that. That's the shits, all this stuff. And then I go out and do it and I would make it a point. And then I got really good at that. And then it turned out my body felt better, <laughs> which, which is always a good thing in that yeah, business. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm also like that. If you tell me I can't do something, I'm nine times out of 10 going to do everything I can um, to prove you wrong. And I'm not afraid to fail. So uh, I'll, I'll go for it. So I think that's probably why I like stories that go there and do yeah. weird things. And that's like earlier, we were talking about you need, you need to find your thing, right? And it's not going to be copying someone else's thing, not the white boots, right? That might have been your thing, right? Uh, and it's usually where people tell you you can't go, right? Because you can't go there because no one's done it before, yeah. right? Uh, or done anything, you know, exactly or, or even similar. Um, and, so, uh, and so very often, you know, looking for, you know, your thing, it's going to be where people tell you you can't even look right um, yeah and, and so um that's one of the more useful things that that's come that comes out of reading reviews uh the less useful things are feeling sad and uh getting upset yes uh like how can you possibly think that because uh, some of my favorite ones are uh you know you'll, you'll read something like this person did not read my book at all like i don't know what they're talking about you know <laughs> i mean i see yeah i i know what you mean because sometimes people review my favorite books that I've read in and out. And I'm like, yeah. what did you read? You're like, that's not even what it's about. Like, what are you talking about? All the time. Uh, uh, yeah, it's perplexing. Um, 
but that's uh, uh that's the power of the internet right is uh everyone gets to say what they want and uh it's up to us as the consumer to filter out the garbage yeah uh yep exactly that's uh that's one of the consequences uh, yeah. which is of course why we have some of those fandom fights because people are not so good at the filtering but right. uh but yeah you know you, you can just disengage so which is uh why I, I i try not to look at such things so yeah I, I told I can uh, I can definitely relate to that. I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, to uh, Justin's question, I haven't read Armor, I'm afraid, uh, but I will I will put it on the long list. Um, so if Justin's pulling cool. it up, uh, he's definitely I, I don't know uh, when it was from, but he uh, he has so many out there recommendations. I mean, they're awesome, but like he just knows so a vast array of books that I haven't even heard of, uh, and they're yeah, almost it's... always good amazing how much is sort of just dropped off right yeah uh, i can't remember the exact statistic but i think something like 90 percent of classical music that gets radio play is from four composers uh it's, it's, yeah it's it's beethoven bach mozart and is it brahms i think it's another b i think it's brahms uh and so like there's obviously like there are other classical composers you've heard of right you've heard of like chopin or vivaldi or or uh you know a puccini or whoever right and those are just the ones you've heard of, right yeah. there's like so much more no one listens to and that's true of like everything that's true of rock music that's true it's true of science fiction there's so many writers i mentioned lee brackett earlier nobody yeah. nobody even knows who i'm talking about uh but she was a pulp writer from like the 40s and 50s she wrote the original draft of empire strikes back um uh, before uh before lauren uh lawrence Kasdan came in and rewrote it really uh, she got cancer and passed away. Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's a, an earlier version of Empire Strikes Back that was written by, by Lee Brackett, who is amazing. She's kind of, her stuff's kind of like, it's kind of like John Carter, uh, you know, or some of her stuff. She's got a bunch of different things, but she's got a, a guy who's from Mercury and he like goes and fights witches on Mars and, you know, <laughs> really cool stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, she's got like an Indiana Jones in space guy. I can't remember his name. Um, is it Northwest Smith, I think is his name. It's like from, it, it's a 40s thing, right? So it's got kind yeah. of that, that like 40s shine on it. But uh, um, but uh, she's she's one of the greats and nobody nobody talks about her. No one talks about Seal Moore. Uh, nobody talks about Clark Ashton Smith, who's like basically Lovecraft for people who've already read all of Lovecraft. Uh, mm -hmm. He was writing at the same time and he's frankly creepier. Um, he also drew his own art, which only helps make it creepier. Yeah. But he was published right alongside Lovecraft and Weird Tales of the Period. Nobody reads nobody reads Clark Ashton Smith anymore. I think that's uh, the that's like piece of the I don't want to call it an addiction, but like that's what keeps me coming back to the well time after time is finding these things. Uh, and even like there's like levels to it, right? Like when I got back into it all fantasy, you know, I read a song of ice and fire that catapulted me, right? And then you have Brandon Sanderson jumping out. Of course, you have Tolkien and all these things. Um, and then I find Robin Hobb, who is a very successful author. But to me, who's Robin Hobb? Yeah. I thought it was a guy. The first time I read the name, I thought Robin. I thought it was a dude. Uh, it turns out, you know, it's a wonder wonderful lady that writes a wonderful series, you know. And then I read all 16 of her books. I'm flabbergasted. And then you go further down the rabbit hole and you find talk to people like you who are giving out these names that have been forgotten through time. And you find those hidden gems. And then the beautiful thing is, is that you then get to spread the word. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Uh, I see someone here is a Clark Cashin Smith fan, so that is awesome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I learned about Clark Cashin Smith from Tim Powers, who is another writer that I think everybody should read. Uh, Tim is he's he's uh, still working, and uh, he probably. Uh, my fun Tim Powers fact is he's probably responsible for the inspiration for Pennywise. Uh, Wait, what? Yeah, there's a book called uh, The Anubis Gates, which is kind of the original steampunk book. The Anubis uh, Gates. Uh, it came out in I think the I think the 70s, it might be the 80s, and I can't remember. But it features a psychic clown who lives in sewers in uh, Victorian London, and it predates it by like four years. Oh, and, wow. Uh, there's like a whole thing where people think Stephen King got it from this book. Uh, and it's a cool book. It's about time travel and Lord Byron and Egyptian gods. And Tim Powers is one of the best writers I've ever read. And nobody has read, uh, nobody has read his stuff that I've spoken to. Oh, I just added to my TBR. 
So yeah, uh, yeah, he's great. Uh, uh, Severian here. Uh, hey man, is a big fan of Declare. Declare is one of my favorite Tim Powers novels too. Uh, this guy like writes crazy stuff. Declare is like a John Le Carre spy thriller, but it's about genies in Noah's Ark. <laughs> um, and stop it's like like stopping the soviets from getting noah's ark it's like an indiana jones meets like like james bond spy thriller uh it's so cool a uh, great writer and he was he's a big clark ashton smith fan so we were talking about all this old stuff and he you know uh peered over his glasses at me and was like you haven't read smith uh you know that's awesome uh, but, uh, it's, it's fun. That's my favorite part about hanging out with science fiction writers is talking about the, the all the old stuff Yeah, um, because it's really like a dying part of the tradition. And I, you know, it's, I, I feel like the science fiction community has done a really poor job, uh, like as a culture of maintaining its culture because it, we're kind of like built around new stuff, right? It's like, you know, award cycle, award cycle, award cycle. Yeah. And like, there's kind of like the retro Hugo thing, right? Where people are like, let's go look and like, who should get an award from 1925, right? Uh, and that's kind of cool, but like, it's really academic and nobody like pays attention to it because it's really academic. Yeah. Uh, and it's an award, which people don't pay attention to awards anyway, um, you know, anymore. Uh, but like, we're so like, what's the next book, right? We're like, always moving forward that there's this whole, like, you know, beautiful tradition of like books. There's more now than anybody could ever read. Uh, and, and some of it's really, really cool and like really, really weird, <laughs> um, which is some of the best stuff. So, um, so yeah, powers is awesome. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. And I think, uh, unfortunately a lot of it has to do with the fact that, when something is uh, a bit dated, um, it seems to go to the, oh, that's older, as if it has nothing to offer. Uh, and I think that this is more of a surface level issue because I, I think like most serious readers, you know, people who read all the time do know that there are just some amazing gems to be found. Uh, but it is the people who look at the best time, uh, the time's best li uh, seller list, and they only do that and they're looking for the next hit. And it's kind of, kind of a prominent issue in, in culture, right? Like we just, People entertain us. They're out, out the door. Next person up, and then, right? and then it's the next thing, right? Which, especially in like in like popular popular culture, is the really unfortunate side effect of killing a lot of people. Uh, you yeah, know, like these people develop all sorts of medical issues because of whatever, and they get thrown away. Um, but that's a whole that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> you know, it's also the case that we like judge everything that's old by the standards of the worst things that are old, right? Like some books aren't dated at all. <laughs> like, like, like Lord of the Rings is fine. Like, there's, there's not really a problem with it. Um, but there, there's some other things that are like way more readable. Uh, you know, like I don't think Conan is is hard to read for how old it is at yeah. all. Uh, I think, I think Burroughs, like Tarzan, is pretty readable. That's maybe some content that people take issue with, right? But in terms of like the actual writing, uh, it's totally accessible. Um, and there's there's it's not like it's written in in ye old english right, right. Or, or something like that but i'm also the guy who like you know sees no problem trying to teach shakespeare to kids i think that's perfectly doable uh you know so no uh, maybe it's just me but i do think uh that we uh yeah that we tend to throw stuff out just because it might not work anymore i don't know uh and you know these people haven't even read it so uh, yeah, I, I think that's like one of my missions is like going back and like reading a lot of the older stuff uh, and not just the well-known stuff as I move forward, especially with sci-fi, because the cool thing about not being super well-read in sci-fi is the fact that I can kind of go chronologically. Like, obviously, I'm going to read the new stuff like, you know, that Sun Eater series is great, but yeah, uh, I heard it's, okay. yeah, I heard, I heard it's pretty good. Uh, author is a real nice guy I hear, uh, <laughs> but uh, but I could kind of work chronologically through the decades. Uh, now the question is, is how far back do you go? Uh, cause that's the big question, right? Cause I, I, these people will, people will make weird claims. Oh, oh, this is a fun one, right? Cause we're talking about the Romans. Uh, people like to say that like Mary Shelley is the first science fiction writer. It's a totally arbitrary choice. It's not true. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, like anything that people understood as science fiction, like, like, as a genre is later, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like turn of the 20th century, 80 years later, Vern Wells. That's really when it starts to turn into something. It's Gernsback who kind of coins the genre as a name. 
Uh, but there's stuff that's earlier. There's a dude from the uh, second century named Lucian of Samosata. He's a Greek writer. He's a Greek Roman writer. It's an amazing wrote name. In Greek. It's pretty cool. That's a great name. Uh, uh, but he wrote a book called A True Story, and it is uh, not remotely a true story. It's like a goofy kind of like like Gulliver's Travels kind of adventure where uh, people uh, go uh, they go through the Pillars of Heracles out into the Atlantic from the Mediterranean, and they end up like in space. And they uh, like it talks about a war between the people of the sun and the people of the moon, and, like a bunch of like goofy stuff, right? And, like it's clearly like got some science fiction stuff going on, right? Uh, but it's from it's from like like one seventy something, I think. Um, it's really early, right? And like um, uh, Kepler, Johannes Kepler wrote a uh, wrote what you kind of think of as like a sword and planet adventure story, where his mother gives him some potion and he goes to the moon. Uh, and he like travels around the solar system. So the the Mary Shelley thing is like totally, totally arbitrary. Uh, and it's it's from people who just want her to be first, which like fine, you know, I get it, but it's it's a random choice. And there's just all this really weird uh, earlier stuff. I think Voltaire wrote a story about aliens, um, hmm. even. And I, I I am famously against Voltaire. But uh, it's a running joke with Mike. Uh, but uh, but I think he wrote it. He did. It's called uh, Micro Megas. It's about aliens visiting Earth. It's kind of a satire being Voltaire, right? But it like there's a bunch of this earlier stuff. I don't know that you'd need to go back that far. You know, <laughs> like, I'd probably go back to like 1900 if I yeah. wanted to like read science fiction because when it starts to really become a genre. Yeah. Uh, but the Roman one's kind of cool. It's not that long. Uh, but it's, it's kind of cool that it exists at all. Um, so do you, you know, with, with saying this, you know, and talking about like when it comes about, right. When the sci-fi genre, you know, there's all these, you know, there's some people way, way back in the day, obviously that are thinking beyond the stars, uh, and all these things and, and using their imagination to go places we haven't even dreamed of back then. Do you feel like sci-fi can only get more popular as the world becomes smaller? Like we talked about earlier, like, is that the next step of, like, is that a next step for sci-fi now that the world has become so small with cell phones, with the internet, that the imagination has to go to dreaming about the stars and galaxies? I hope so, because I, I feel like we have to we have to go somewhere, uh, you know, um, and uh, if we're just sort of stuck in this world, right, you know, um, we, we're either going to turn inward and go insane or we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep turning outward. So I hope, you know, cause like the big hope of like, of like Gurns back and Campbell and, and Gene Roddenberry is that these stories will inspire, you know, the next generation actually do something about it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and go out there or at least make the cell phone in the case of Star Trek. Right. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it makes some sort of, of, of uh, advancement, right. Advancing the cause of, of, of human adventure. Uh, and, uh, and I, I hope that we can do that. I don't know that the stories need to actually be very scientific to do that. In fact, I think that, that sometimes they, they kneecap themselves if they get lost in the techno babble. Uh, not that techno babble isn't fun, but it isn't fun for everybody. And I think, um, I, uh, so I was on a panel once with David Weber, uh, who I like a lot, David, uh, I used to work with him, right. Cause I worked for his publisher and uh, he was making fun of Star Wars, as uh, David is wont to do. Uh, because if you've ever read David's stuff, the Honor Harrington books, is very, very technical. Uh, he's really, really interested in how naval warfare works, and he's tried to make it as plausible uh, within the, like, science fictional goofiness, you know, that he's made up, right? Like, how star drives work or something. But he's tried to, like, figure out, like, oh, you wouldn't actually just, like, do broadside attacks with laser cannons. Like, that's not going to work, right? Uh, and he's actually, like, a naval historian is, like, part of his background. So oh, wow. He's really, uh, really got some of that great age of sail energy in the books. But he gets really, really into, like, how missiles work and, like, oh, it's mostly missile warfare and... You know, how are we armoring these things? What's, you know, target acquisition like? And he was like, and Star Wars, of course, just like, it's just World War II. And I'm like, yeah, but David, like way more people have seen Star Wars, right? And have been infect affected by it than have read your books. And his correct response was, well, you know, I, he never said it. He's way too nice. It would be to point out that a lot more people have read his books than mine. Uh, but he did not say that. Uh, David is a very nice guy. 
Uh, and he was like, wow, you know, yeah, but, uh, you know, but those movies are still dumb. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but like, there are plenty of people who can go on to be a scientist because they watch Luke Skywalker, you know, force push a robot, right? Hmm. You know, it's, it's not, the, the stories need to inspire people. They don't, they don't need to be, you know, um, they don't need a to lesson be, in themselves, a lesson right. in themselves, right? They don't need to be a, a tech essay. Because uh, I, I don't particularly enjoy the stories that are. Uh, I'm not a big, uh, not a big Asimov guy. Uh, oh, okay. You know, I um, uh, it just doesn't really work for me. I'm not saying it's bad. It just doesn't work for me. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah. So I, I hopefully, hopefully, uh, where science fiction is going is still on this mission to inspire people to look outward, as opposed to to look down. Uh, I do. I do think I can see certain strains in the genre trying to pull in either direction. There's some writers who would rather people look inward uh, and and think about themselves and and uh, instead of the world and their relationship with it. But um, I, I I hope that science fiction is taking us out to the extent that you know literature does does anything. Uh, yeah. Because of course you know people have to be inspired to actually make those changes. They can't just read the stories and and go. Yeah. Uh, so I hope so. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty hopeful too. And I think that the genre is only going to get bigger and bigger and, you know, the more voices, probably the better <laughs> we'll, we'll get some yeah. gems out of there. Yeah. If, if nothing else, the proliferacy of like all these new stories and, and new writers, it makes it a lot harder for any like single writer to really stand up and be counted. Uh, which, but it's really good for, for readers, right? Uh, I had a conversation with Kevin Anderson, not to keep name dropping once, but uh, he uh, he was talking about metal music because it turns out Kevin Anderson is like a big uh, like Nightwish fan. And, and he was like, and if all I want to do is listen to bands that are exactly like Nightwish, that is all I, I, that's all I have to listen to. And it's exactly like that with books now. If people want this very narrow flavor of fantasy, they have an infinite supply. Uh, you know, um, and, and so I think that's good, right? Like if, if for nothing else, it's great for readers. And yeah. so if there's something that really like works for you as a reader, you can find, you know, infinite supplies of uh, Joe Abercrombie and his, his imitators, right? Or Tolkien and his imitators or whoever, right? And, and I think that's awesome. I think that uh, it's never been a better time to be a reader. And that's great. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because uh, I've read some that are supposed to be germ like right? Or Joe Abercrombie-like. Uh, and... For sometimes it works, but a lot of times it doesn't for me personally. Yeah, uh, well, this is the divergent problem, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Some, some people, some people just want the definite article, right? They don't mm. want the, uh, they don't want the to keep listed. Like I, you know, like I would only like if I were a Nightwish fan. Like I don't need bands that are like Nightwish. I have Nightwish, right? Yeah, I'll just go listen to the best hits and and, yeah. and be good with that. That that's kind of how I feel. Um, a lot of times about, Oh, this is the next, you know, or people who love Joe Abercrombie will love this, but, and then I read it and I go, I'd just rather read, go read Joe Abercrombie again, I guess. Yeah. That's the danger with that pitch. I, I think we've become addicted to the, oh, yeah. it's like game of Thrones meets uh, star Wars or whatever thing. And I think that like dedicated readers are really starting to recoil from that. We sure are. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's uh Yeah. Uh, I, they did it to me. They slapped me with one of those, but that's a marketing <laughs> move. And uh, it works. Mark, it, 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 I think it works if it's a weird enough combination. Uh, <laughs> still, right? Like if people are like, how do the uh, pineapple and, and pizza? Yeah. <laughs> weird enough, I'll try it. But, uh, you know, as an Italian, no. <laughs> um, you know, but, but but like if it's a weird enough pitch, I think it, I think that still works. But most people are like, oh no, not uh, not not Game of Thrones meets X again. Uh, pass. I yeah, think is, is the more common response. So, I mean, I generally, uh, and this is just for me, uh, when I see a title of a video or a review that starts out with that, most of the time I scroll by it and I say, okay, if they have nothing to tell me. Uh, it, it, but I, I don't usually find that as a reflection on the work. I have a, a to me, you know, obviously being a reviewer, I look more at the reviewer and I go, you know, and but the, the you know, the hard thing is, man, I got to be honest with you. Sometimes exactly. that is the way to do it. 
sometimes you in your head, you make that connection and you feel like you have to say, like, there's like this impulse where you get to say, this is what this is. Um, like I, I, and I won't say any, say the name of it, but when I read empire of silence, I said, Oh, this is what I wanted this other series to be. Like, this is what I wanted out of that series. And I got it out of this instead. How awesome is that? I never say that. Uh, one, because I don't like the comparisons. I think work should be able to stand on their own. Uh, and then two, I just know it kind of sounds cheesy. So, <laughs> but there yeah, is well, something like, about that. Criticism is an art too, right? Like people like kind of, kind of don't think about that because it's been kind of, it's become like everybody's pastime, right? Because we have Twitter. Yeah. Uh, but like actually critiquing something meaningfully, right, is 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 a lost art in a lot of ways. Mm. And so, you know, it's, it's cool what you guys do, because, you know, the fact that you can be a critic and have an audience at all is kind of amazing, uh, considering that everybody is a critic for free now, you know, um, you know, yeah. uh, so it's it, like most people don't even want to hear it anymore. So it's really cool that. Uh, uh, it's really cool when, when, you know, you guys, you guys do what you do. So what, what made you make a YouTube channel? Um, and uh, I was, so I, I wanted to a lot earlier, uh, because I, I like YouTube. I watch a lot of, I watch a lot of stuff on YouTube. Same. <laughs> uh, and so I thought, Hey, this would be a cool thing to do. And there probably aren't a lot of writers who are doing it cause they're like on Twitter or something. And, um, I decided to leave Twitter uh, a little bit more than a year ago. And I already had the channel a little bit, but I decided to really go in on it as a replacement for that. Mm -hmm. uh, because I figured, again, there are not a lot of writers who are on here, uh, particularly traditionally published ones. And so I thought I could be a, a, a louder voice in a smaller room. Sure. Um, and so maybe that would help. And I think it's working. You know, I think that the, the you know recent traction here on booktube has been uh sort of a testament to that strategy paying off maybe a little bit although now i've ruined it because i've explained my plan so inevitably some you know superhero is going to shut it all down in the next couple minutes <laughs> um caught me monologuing but um but yeah so i just i thought it would be different um because you need to do something different and um and, and uh, like uh, like Derry here says, I found that it's been a lot uh, a lot better. It's been a lot more uh, positive a place to be. Uh, I think it's just the nature of yes. the fact that like I actually like people see my face, they hear my voice. You know, I'm talking to them instead of yeah. you know just tweeting pithily or or commenting on Dune and, and Tor.com or whatever. Right? Uh, it, it's a little bit more personal. And I and think a that, character limit. Right. Like Twitter has a character limit. There's only so much you can say. And sometimes whenever you take out keywords. Yeah. It also encourages pithiness and like biting. And it's because you've got to get it in, you know, this one little, little chunk. And so you got to be as snappy as possible, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you want retweets. Uh, and so it just kind of encourages bad behavior. Whereas, you know, we're at two hours, right. And like, it's like the opposite of a tweet and uh, you know, uh, and, and so I, I think it's been a good move, uh, you know, just, just psychologically, it's been, it's been a lot more fun. It's a little bit more work, obviously, you know, yeah. uh, tweets take no effort, uh, but, uh, and I'm not as good at it as, as a lot of other people, right. Uh, you know, I don't make as many videos or, or, or even necessarily have as much to talk about. I'd love to do like, you know, lore videos and things for the universe, but, uh, I am, um, uh, you know, I, I, sorry, I got distracted reading a comment. Um, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I, I, but I haven't had the time to like figure out how to do it properly. My like video editing skills are like practically non-existent even still. Same. So I need to, re <laughs> that's why I've been doing so many live streams. No one has to, no one has to put up with my, my antics. You're telling but, my secrets. <laughs> aha, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll be over to shut you down too. Now that you're, like, the, the, the plot has been revealed. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, so I, it's been fun. It's been fun. I really like it. And, um, you know, see what else I can do. I have had a few readers. I've been surprised. were like, so are you going to stream Elden Ring? Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I might, uh, that's a, that's a pretty fun idea. I have the machine to do it. So, oh um, man, that w I would watch that as I'm also playing Elden Ring. <laughs> yeah. I think it'd be pretty cool. Uh, I'm not very good at it. So I'm afraid my readers will make fun of me. 
as I die for the eighth time fighting some flying cat monsters. Only eight times? No. <laughs> I think I died I think, I think that was how many it was. There's a, a <laughs> weird floating cat statue really was giving me trouble earlier. I think I saw um, somebody fighting that, actually. It's like in a dungeon and the cat jumps up. And I was just like, what a silly thing. It looks really weird, but it's yeah. kind of unsettling. I love it. It was, I... it was a little creepy. Well, this is a great segue because I wanted to bring this up so bad. Um, and <laughs> some people in the chat will be like, why are you bringing this up? But uh, Elden Ring is heavily influenced by Kentaro Mora, Miura's Berserk. And Berserk is something I've just done. Yeah, that's it. I saw it and I was like, yeah. ah, and I, whenever I read your interview from 2014, you had just finished reading the manga and I just started. I am through Deluxe Volume 4, I think is the last one I finished. I just got out of the Golden Age arc. I was about to say, it's the end of the Golden Age. Ooh, oh my yeah. goodness, my friend. Uh, so you want to talk about someone taking risks. I mean, I, I think Berserk is not for everyone at all, not even close. However, it has really captivated me in a lot of different ways, um, surprisingly, because I don't react well to a lot of really over the top gore um, or just like heinous things happening. Even though I, I read a lot of like grimdark, something about seeing it is way worse to me. It's yeah, it's, it's very hard to watch. What, um, what was your experience with Berserk? Uh, so I kind of knew because it's kind of a meme right uh you know the, there's sort of the the griffith did nothing wrong meme that yeah. people, will, people yeah. will play so i was like what is this about which is right? absurd uh <laughs> yeah it, it, it's deliberately absurd right yeah um, i feel very bad for griffith i feel very bad for all of the characters uh you know it's it's a very hard world uh that they all live in um and especially um like actually that you haven't read that far so never mind no. um <laughs> but um i feel i feel very bad for all of the characters uh, it is very hard to uh, hard to see. I, I generally am of the opinion there's like no real reason to write a sex scene. Um, uh, I like to actually show it. Like there's a lot of reason for like characters to have sex, right? Uh, and, and especially when it is, um, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, uh, horrible horrible circumstances. Ab abuse, yeah. Yes, that are. Um, I, I, I get very. It's very hard for me to talk about this stuff um so uh it's very it is very a very very little reason to actually depict that stuff but uh it is a very bold choice to actually do it um and uh and it works uh it's very effective in berserk it's very hard to read yeah um and because you have to look at it right that's why it's effective because he actually makes you look yep. right um and it shouldn't uh, I, I would never advise anyone else try it, right? I would That's never, what I've been saying. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, the, you have to take these risks, right? And there are moments, right, you know, in, uh, in writing anything where you're like, I don't know if I should really do this sequence, right? Yeah. Uh, either because it's too, it's too bold, it's too, you know, risky, it's too unpleasant, it's too uh, insane, uh, yeah. you know, whatever, right? And, and, I really respect that he went for it, right? And and this is something. Um, it, it, it's really it, again, it's hard to talk about because it is such an unpleasant subject matter, right? Yeah. Um, but he he doesn't he doesn't pull any punches, and he doesn't um, he doesn't give any of the characters a break, right? They're all like you absolutely feel. Uh, for all of those characters, right? You understand why they're all, you know, doing what they're doing as as the Golden Age arc is playing out. It all, it's like a, it's like watching a train wreck, right? Yeah. Uh, it really, really is. Um, and every single one of those characters is hurt so badly um, that there's just something, there's something so, because the thing about Berserk, right, is that as dark as it is, Guts never gives up, yep. right? And, that, and if he did, it wouldn't work, right? Yep. Uh, because that's really that's really what it's about. I hate the the sort of like nihilist streak in a lot of grim dark because I just I just don't. Uh, and, and so for a long time I thought I didn't like dark stories, mm -hmm. and, and so that one really like made a point to me, which is like it's not the darkness that's the issue. It, it's it's getting lost in it uh, that bothers me. And, and somehow, as black as that story gets in a lot of places, and it's not just the golden age. Um, he never, he never, uh, he never gets lost in it, and 
He still humanizes uh, the worst characters. Uh, even though, like, it's a manga, right? So the characters are kind of over the top and, like, you know, not really human in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, it, it, sorry, this is a very difficult thing to talk about, but he, because he doesn't, uh, man, he, 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 keeps, he keeps all of those characters really, really sympathetic in the sense that, like, you understand them, right? Yeah. You feel yeah. for them. And it, I have never seen anything be that ambitious and pull it off. Uh, and, and so it's, it, it occupies a very special place. Uh, I would also not recommend it to most people that, uh, because yeah. it is such a difficult read. I usually am very careful about um, uh, about making um, about making. Rec I usually don't care when I recommend things. I'm usually like, yeah, you know, like you know, you might like it, you might not, right? Yeah. Like, I'll, like I'll tell anybody to try. Book of the New Sun. Book of the New Sun is some really hard stuff in it too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also really difficult to read, uh, and so like I'll tell people, this probably you're not going to like it because it's like a very difficult book. Berserk, I will actively like actually I will actually say, man, like uh, if you can't handle this stuff, just don't bother. Right? Go go read anything else. Yeah, um, I, I'm pretty big for knowing who you're recommending something to, um, but I'm kind of like I'm like give it a shot. Like, what's the worst that could happen? With Berserk, it's a totally different thing, but it's so it's so strange. It's almost like its own phenomenon because I mean, listen to you talk about it. I mean, a lot of this stuff's resonating with me. It's an impactful piece of art, and it is different than anything else I've ever really read. Um, and it provoked uh, anger in me, um, like a very visceral response that not very many things have done uh and it's interesting because i've had books do that for me reading it but for some reason ma manga i never expected that from manga i just didn't to be honest uh and maybe that's me having uh low expectations of the medium because i was ignorant that's definitely plausible um it, it definitely stretches the medium further than i think a lot of people have gone with it yeah not, it's it, not to say there isn't some other like really like really deep and profound examples of storytelling in manga but a lot of it is safer um, yeah. Or if it's unsafe, it's unsafe in safer ways. Hmm. Uh, and because uh, there, like, there are ways to push the envelope that are more acceptable than others. Yeah. And that was a pretty outrageous series of decisions when it was originally published in like the eighties and nineties. Oh uh, yeah. I think I think Golden Age wrapped up in ninety seven in its original publication. So it was a different world, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and so there's some really bold choices there. And I think that's, I think that's evidence that it's like great art, right? Yeah. Uh, because it like you, you're even after you've experienced it, you don't really know how to like articulate all of your feelings about it. And, um, a lot cool. Nick's picking it up. Awesome. Yeah. yeah uh, and I, this is where I feel weird because I'm like, I hope that you enjoy it. And I think Nick will like, uh, I think Nick will too. Knowing Nick, I think so. But, um, uh, because we talked a bit too. Nick's one of my he's one of my patrons. Yeah. Uh, thank you, my, Nick. Uh, mine, mine too. <laughs> oh, Nick, I sent your books to you today. Since you're here, uh, they're on their way. Uh, but um, but yeah. So it, it very rarely do I do I hesitate to recommend something to somebody, and that's that's right at the top of the list. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's really really good though. Uh, yeah. And it's also it, it it's comforting to me too, right? Because uh, it does the same thing with references and and intertextuality that I do. Uh, so like the God Hand are all named after novels by nineteen uh, sixty sci fi writers. Someone just told me that, and it blew my mind. Yeah, which it's. It's so great, right? That's the best example of it. Like I've read Slan and Ubik, right? I've read Conrad. <laughs> uh, actually, I've read Void too. I've read them all. Uh, but uh, you know, so and they're but they're also clearly based on the uh, the Hellraiser monsters, right? Uh, you know, they've got the labyrinth and all of that stuff, and and so it's like he plays with these other people's ideas in ways that really makes them their own. That's and awesome. so I think about that a lot when I do get the the constant refrain, you know, Christopher, you're too close to Dune, right? Mm. You're too close to Gene Wolfe, and uh, yeah, it was on purpose, you know, like. I was trying to do something with that. And so I look at, um, uh, I look at, uh, I look at Berserk a lot for that. And I'm Kintaro Miura is, uh, he was my favorite living writer until he passed away a little while ago. And that, uh, hit me pretty hard. Yeah. Um, uh, 
you know. And so it's cool too, right? Because um, because uh, the the Souls games sort of homages work so heavily as well. My uh, character's and, name is Guts. Um, <laughs> I I picked the prisoner so I could wear the helmet because it Griffith. it looks exactly like the Griffith's helmet, right? Yes. Except for the the closed eye. So yep. Uh, you know, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I just really, really love it. Uh, it's a great series. I own all the deluxe editions. I've been, I've been I'm almost them. there. So, uh, yeah, it's great. Um, and, uh, I really wish, um, I really wish he were still around. Yeah. So, um, sorry, get, sorry. It's a very hard thing to talk about the sort of stuff that that series is about, especially online. You know, I don't, I understand. Uh, it's a very delicate subject and I don't want to hurt anyone's, anyone's feelings because it is so delicate. And, and of course, you know, um, but, uh, uh, I've got a question about new son to try and try and escape the berserk, uh, poll here. Uh, <laughs> uh, our short son and long son regarded as on par with new son. Uh, I think most people consider them lesser works, uh, but I just read long son and, uh, I, uh, I love it. Uh, I thought it was great. It's a little bit more confusing a story, but it's, um, it's, it's perversely easier to follow. Like you understand what's going on, but like the full context is something that kind of, kind of takes a little while to click. Uh, really cool series though. Long song is about a generation colony ship that leaves earth. It's earth with a U and, uh, same planet though. And it's, uh, the people don't even remember it's a colony ship anymore. So it's just the world to them. And so they'll describe, you know, this very weird, they're living inside a cylinder, right? Like at the end of interstellar and it's just normal and there are robots and they just think the robots are just a different kind of people. And just everything is uh, really, really uh, well grounded in its setting. And that's a cool thing too, because Gene Wolf is just too busy being better than everyone else. <laughs> where all the characters have very distinct speech patterns. And so frequently dialogue will show up without a speaker tag. You'll still know who it is. Which is beautiful. Uh, even before they introduce themselves. It's so good on like a craft level. Mm. And um, and uh, the main character is also a lot easier to like. Severian is kind of a, kind of a, kind of a Griffith uh, in, a, in a couple ways. Uh, he's not a pleasant fellow. Uh, but uh, Silk in Wong Sun is very easy to like. He is, he is as moral as they come. Uh, and yeah, Paul here, Silk for Call Day. Damn right. Uh, <laughs> he's got my vote. Uh, yeah, those are great series, but you kind of need to read New Sun first. Uh, cool. So, yeah. I'm actually reading Book of the New Sun this year, if everything goes to plan. Uh, and cool. Darren, thank you for the five spots, said, I follow Book of the New Sun better than Malazan, which makes me think of Malazan prepared me more to read Gene. Well, well that, that's really interesting because I also just finished Malazan. I loved it. Uh, and I enjoyed the challenge that that presented to me. I've heard Book of the New Suns on a whole different level. Um, I cannot wait to read Gene Wolf as someone who enjoys prose. Uh, and again, enjoys very weird things. I think that Wolf is going to end up being one of my favorite authors. I really yeah, do. He, he is uh, second only to Tolkien in my book. Yeah. I mean, many people consider Wolf to be the best writer like ever. So yeah, it's a, it, that is a reasonable opinion. Um, yeah, I uh, think. Oh, just bought the folio edition. Awesome. I have, I have the signed folio editions. I spent a, bajillion dollars to get that because they announced it right after gene passed away and i wanted to get the book signed because i had um uh i wanted to get a quote from him and i tried to really really hard uh and uh he'd been very ill and we just didn't get a chance so damn i i wanted to get him because uh he's tremendous just tremendous uh <laughs> severian says he's kind of a griffith nice uh <laughs> I, uh, I actually just got your Lesser Devils um, special edition signed and numbered. I found it. Uh, Scott actually was like, hey, there's one available. And I can't remember what the site it was. It was from the UK. And I snagged it. And I got oh, it. Oh, that and Derrida books? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. They're, they made it. Uh, they are a little bookshop in the UK. They just started their own press. And they're doing these uh, like collector's editions with me. We're going to do another one later this year. I'm going to do Queen of Mid-Ashes, which is a sequel to Hell in Dark. It's a novella. Uh, that I wrote, it's uh, right between, it's right after it, uh, like well before Demon in White, and we're ba I'm gonna ba uh, pa package that with a bunch of other short stories. Um, so we'll do that, and then we're talking about doing some other stuff, and maybe even doing the whole series. Fantastic uh, as deluxe editions later on. 
I'm in. So, I, I I pre-ordered uh, Kingdoms of Death uh, through, I believe it's a local book. It's signed by you. Uh, Quill Ridge Books. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if people do want to get, uh, shameless plug, uh, if people do want to get Kingdoms of Death signed, you can pre-order it from quailridgebooks.com. Uh, they are an independent bookstore here in Raleigh. Uh, I wor have worked with them for years now. And uh, I just have to fill out the other comments section during checkout and say, hey, I want Christopher to sign my book. And they will add it to the stack. Um, you can even order the earlier books like now, and they'll give me a call, and, and I can go over there and sign them. I just signed some day before yesterday. So That is awesome. I wish I would have got my uh, first three from there then. I really wish, because I, then I would have all, because obviously book four will be signed, and then I'll get book five and six and seven um, as well. So uh, what was the website one more time? Uh, Quail Ridge Books, uh, like the bird, quail. Uh, Quail Ridge is a little a little bookstore uh, in uh, North Hills in Raleigh. Uh, so it's uh, they've been here forever, um, you know. But uh, they're a great store, great store. Uh, I'm doing my signing there too. If anyone is in driving distance of Raleigh, uh, I will be there on March 24th for Kingdoms of Death. I think at like 7 p.m. So um, yeah, I uh, love working with them. Uh, my uncle actually did a bunch of the like decorations for the store. He's a uh, industrial artist. Uh, so really, he, yeah, yeah. He does like museum exhibits and stuff. Uh, like he made, like he made a bunch of dinosaurs for a museum and things like that. It's really cool. Uh, but he did a bunch of their, like, you know, uh, for decorations, like a big arch inside. It's all like, like kind of looks like bronze. Uh, so yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, so if anybody is, is close enough to drive, I'd love to, love to have you out there and, uh, maybe we can set a new pre-order record for them too. So. You said it was March 4th? Uh, March 24th. 24th, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's only four hours from me. Oh, yeah. Oh, hmm. Mm. Hmm. We'll see. I have to, I have to see uh, what, what the boss says, a.k.a. Yeah, wife. Yeah, I know how that goes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Thursday, um, which could work. Yeah, maybe maybe I will take a road trip. That would be a lot of fun. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Be, be legit. Uh, and actually, it'll be cool. My friend uh, DJ Butler, who's a fantasy writer, is going to be in town, so he'll be there too. Very I don't cool. Know if he's going to do anything, but I can I can tell people about his books, which I try to do at every possible time. Because <laughs> uh, Dave is great. He's uh, another one of those writers that you know needs needs a little more needs a little more help. Uh, his series is. Uh, the first book is Witchy Eye. He uh, Dave is like a like a folklore expert, American folklore expert, sort of his thing. And the series he like rebuilt America like a fantasy empire, and so it's set in like 1800, but in a world where there was never a United States. It's just an American empire. And uh, the uh, main character learns that she's the secret daughter of the Empress of America who just got murdered, and uh, her uncle, who is one of the Pens, right, is in Pennsylvania is uh is out to get her and like uh like ben franklin's descendant is like the bishop of philadelphia and oh like, man oliver cromwell is an immortal necromancer who is like you know <laughs> around behind the scenes it's really it's you talk about weird like it because it's, it's really uh like invested in like uh you know uh like uh settler folklore and native american folklore and like all sorts of just like weird is weird sort of stuff uh, Dave is Dave is brilliant. The man taught himself Ojibwe to write his Native American characters better, and he speaks it now. Wow! Um, like just to write his fiction books, uh, but he'll be there with me, which will be cool. Uh, you know, it's it, he's happens to be in town that week, so uh, it's another one I think people should really check out if they haven't if they haven't heard of him before. He's a really good friend. And he's a really good writer. And um, and you said book one is called The Witching Eye. Uh, that... Witchy Eye. Witchy uh, Eye. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it's got some great Dan Dos Santos art. You want to talk about great covers? Some oh stuff. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a really good series. Uh, really good series. Um, it's so, on the TBR and I just bought it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, cheers. Uh, no, Dave is, uh, I was just at a convention in Pensacola cause conventions are kind of coming back yeah. and, uh, we were hanging out all weekend. So that's awesome, man. Uh, so yeah, and I'm going to try, uh, to get around the country a little bit more. Uh, so, uh, you know, stay, uh, keep an eye out, uh, everybody on the old website and stuff and uh, try to keep everyone updated about uh, head to different parts of the world. So, yeah, if you come up uh, near Baltimore or DC, please let me know. You bet. Please, please, please let me know. Um, 
that that's that's really exciting yeah things are opening up a little bit you know uh, there, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and like you have not just book four coming but book five as well like i i can't imagine how much anticipation you have where the days are probably crawling by to get there but they're also going too quick we're under a month now so it'll, it'll be here really soon i i'm trying to get uh, I've got some prep work for the Queen of Mid Ashes special edition. I want to get out of the way so I can just focus on the new release. Yeah. So uh, it's it's gonna be fun. It, like I said, I haven't done it in a while, so it's uh, you know <laughs> it's pretty exciting. That's so, awesome, man. Um, yeah. Do Do you plan on after Sunday, or do you plan on staying in science fiction? Have you ever like would you consider writing a fantasy series at some point? Yeah. So you? there's a little bit of a risk there, right? It's it's like if your favorite metal band just put out a jazz album. Like right. you actually lose a lot of readers trying to make that move sometimes. Yeah. Uh, like core readership will, they'll follow you anywhere. Right. But there are a lot of casual readers who won't even look. Right. So I would like to do it. Uh, but I do a lot of like standalone novel ideas that are in universe, uh, even that I want to stick with. They might not even recognizably be in the same universe. They may be really late or really early or whatever. Uh, but I, uh, I've got a bunch of ideas I'd like to do there first. Cause I, um, uh, I have this, this philosophy actually got from Butler that the right thing I should do, uh, or the right thing that any writer should really do is try to have a lot of book ones so that if your first book one doesn't look good to somebody, they've got another thing that might be more their speed. And so right now, if people want to start on my work, they really need to start an empire of silence. Um, which if they like the look of it is fine. They'll pick it up. Right. But if they right. don't, they'll pass. Right. And so I want to, I want to take a, take a step and make, you know, three or four standalone books and maybe one of those will turn into the next series, you know, uh, when, and if there's going to be another series and there will be whenever that is. Yeah. Uh, but I want to see if I can get a bunch of these sort of inroads built so that people can say, I'm not sure about this sun eater thing, but uh, you know, this one looks okay. Right. Or, you know, this one's got a robot on the cover or whatever, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and, and just uh, try to broaden the uh, the horizons of the universe a little bit. Yeah, you know? definitely. I, I definitely understand that. And uh, I think anything you put out, I, I'm reading. So I, I'm pretty excited uh, for not just the next two books, but everything that comes post that. And uh, you're young. You're young, man. You got a, a big career ahead of you. I hope so. Yeah. Um, so. Hope it won't be a John Keats situation. No, nah, I've got I, tuberculosis yet. So I have all the faith in you. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to keep you too long, but one last question before we okay. go. Uh, so we've seen a Dune adaptation. Phenomenal, in my opinion. Uh, I like too. Foundation TV show. It is what it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sun Eater. Empire of Silence. Do you go TV or do you go movie? Oh man, um, I think given the structure of the book, TV is probably a better fit. But there's a part of me that like laments the the decline of cinema just as like an art form. Yeah, we don't make we don't make movies like we used to. Dune was what was Dune not the middle Dune finger was, was exactly that. It was we could still make movies, asshole, right? It, uh, and I love series, right? But like, not everything needs to be a series. And so there's a part of me that's like. Should I like, you know, should I, should I stake my, my, my claim there and, and side with movies? Um, certainly, you know, if you do a movie, you have like a higher, like success fail, you know, yeah. uh, threshold, but also if you succeed, like you reach that many more people. Uh, the reality is it won't be up to me, right? Cause what'll happen is that, that somebody will make an offer. They'll be like, Hey, we want to option your books for X, right? Uh, and they might option both, right? We want TV and movie rights for whatever, and we'll figure out what to do with it. And, um, you know, I hope that either of that happens, if only because, you know, I want to be able to, you know, help support my family, right? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. as at the end of the day, like we talk, I talked a lot about like, you know, the big sort of like, you know, uh, ideological mission about writing and all that, but fundamentally, like it's a job, right? You know, it was a really fun job but I want to be able to take care of my family doing it. And that's the most important thing. So sure. even if somebody just options the book and they don't even do anything with it, like I think altered carbon had been optioned since like 99, like they like just kept paying to keep the option because wow. they bought it right after the matrix. I think WB or whoever bought it right after the matrix. And like, this will be like the matrix, right? Like we were saying, 
And it took them like 20 years to decide, wait, this isn't the Matrix we have at home, right? This is its own <laughs> thing. Let's, uh, let's do the Netflix show. Um, but they paid Richard Morgan, like, I think annually to keep the rights for it. So, wow. you know, at the end of the day, like, that would be exciting enough. But I, um, I, think, I think a series is the most reasonable choice uh, yeah. structurally. Uh, but, man, movie would be cool. Yeah, there's uh, Dune to completely changed my outlook on adaptations and what they can be in a cinema. And I, it just reminded me that there is something about cinema that TV does still does not capture or if it does very, very rarely. Yeah, well, um, you just don't have the hardware for it at home, right? Yeah. You can't have the same overwhelming sensory experience. Um, yeah. Unless you're really lucky and you, you know, one of those people, you know, as a family member that spent too much money on a projector. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, so yeah, it, it, man, I just going to the movies is really fun. I just wish there were more to see. Yeah. Um, cause there's just, there's not much unless you really like superheroes. Um, <laughs> that does seem to be it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I would hope at least blockbusters can maybe move a little bit past that. I'm kind of hoping the whole Dune thing will really kick off this new, this new little wave of trying to imitate Dune because, uh, you know, that's well, it was a success and that's the first step, right? Um, uh, like, yeah. uh, um, the last duel flopped, even though apparently it's really good. Um, it flopped and I don't know if we'll see those big historical bat like movies like that again. Like, I, I don't know if for a while. It... Yeah. I know yeah. he wants to do a Cleopatra movie, uh, but I think Patty Jenkins is also doing a Cleopatra movie. Uh... Um, I'm a little more interested in, in, in Denis take. I think he's a better filmmaker. Uh, but you know, either way, you know, we'll see. Um, cause that would be fun. You know, we've had several Cleopatra movies, but you know, we could do, we could do it again. Um, I mean, I'd watch it. Yeah. I, yeah <laughs> like, I let's be it. honest. I'd watch it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's my favorite, one of my favorite periods in history. Right. So yeah, it's a uh, life of Caesar, the end of the Egyptians, you know, but, uh, but yeah, so maybe we'll still get some, but it's hard to say where Hollywood is going anymore. Yeah. Well, maybe Dune will be, uh, you know, the catalyst. I'm sure hoping I'm excited for part two. So. Yeah. Same here. Um, I think it's like the only movie besides Batman, which is next week. I'm really looking forward to. So I have to wait another whole year. <laughs> <laughs> Such yeah. life. If, if everything goes well, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, right. it, it's been wonderful talking to you, man. Uh, yeah, likewise. I, I don't want to take up any more of your Elden Ring time because I know uh, we're both going to get back at it in the lands between. Yeah, I'm, I'm back to it. I need to go. What was I? Uh, what was I fighting? Oh, I just got to a new. I got to a new dungeon. I just dealt with. Like I told you, I dealt with our bald friend from the previous games. Hype. So uh, yeah, go go find him. <laughs> that that's the goal. <laughs> He's out there. Um, so yeah. Anyway, thanks thanks again for having me. This was awesome. This is an excellent. I, I have so many more questions I actually have written down, but we'll do it. We'll, we'll reprise the conversation and we'll do it again, man. Yeah, I'm unsurprised that I managed to prevent us from getting through all the questions. I seem to do this a lot. So. <laughs> that, that's the beauty of this this kind of long form conversation, though. You know, this is uh, Ooh, why sure. it's better than Twitter. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. All right, man. Well, until next time. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, tell everyone where they can find you here on YouTube and also, uh, you know, Pitch the release date for the book next month. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you can find me on YouTube at uh, Sun Eater Books, uh, name of the channel. I, uh, I do a monthly live stream answering questions, sometimes for about this long, uh, you know, and I'll do a bunch of update videos and other things like that. Uh, I'm actually going to do one on Monday at uh, 8 p uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. It's a little earlier than usual. So uh, I almost missed my February stream. As for the book, uh, Kingdoms of Death is book four in the Sun Eater series, and that will be out on March 22nd. Uh, and so I hope you all check it out. And if you haven't read the earlier books, the first is Empire of Silence. You can get that and uh, books two and three uh, basically anywhere books are sold. Uh, so please do. I'd be honored if you uh, if you check them out. Absolutely. And uh, we appreciate your time. I know you're a busy, man. Uh, so thanks for stopping by. If you want to check out Christopher's channel, it's in the description. I actually tagged it. It's the Sun Eater or Sun Eater. I can't remember if there's a V in the YouTube channel name, but it's linked down below. Go hit subscribe. Check out the videos. They're amazing. The summary videos have helped me take a little break between books. Uh, got me all made sure I got all my T's crossed, my uh, I's dotted. So uh, Christopher, thank you so much for your time. 
Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Chat, thank you. My third guest, as always. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks, uh, and I'll have another guest on with Chatting with Nuts. Uh, but until we see you next time, make sure to hit like and subscribe. There's a Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciated. And I'll see you again real, real soon. And remember, until next time, always keep turning the page.